Sound check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sound check.
We're going to get started here in the next minute or two, please. Okay, we will call the Property and Facilities Committee to order here. I'd like to welcome Regent Kramer and President Pro Tem Bates to the Property and Facilities Committee. On Monday afternoon, all of us had the opportunity to go out and tour the University of Iowa campus. Rod gave us a nice tour. I don't know if you knew or not, but the microphone was on, or the outside the bus too. So I think the whole campus got a nice. Uh, tour I've heard of it this as well. happens on occasions. I once uh, pointed out a faculty member, Steve McGuire, Art and Art History, and he started waving at the bus when I was talking to them about him. So I, I either my voice carries too far, or yes, there's some exterior component to these buses. We could go on tour. Either way, it was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we learned a pleasure. lot. It's always a pleasure to, to get that, especially from you. So lots of history, lots of neat stuff going on there. I'm glad so you thank could you for participate. that. Uh, so we'll get started with the minutes of the April 19, 2023 committee meeting. Are there any changes to those minutes? Okay, hearing none, uh, we will recommend those to the board. And the next item on the agenda is uh, Rod Leonard. He's with his presentation. Please, Rod. Thank you, and, and thank you to the entire committee and the Board of Regents for um, our opportunity to share a couple of projects. We've also got some real estate um, matters that David Keft will cover uh, later. Uh, but first, we have two projects to present to the Board of Regents. Uh, the first of the two is a request for approval of the project description and budget related to the new Health Sciences Academic Building on parking lot 14 along Melrose Avenue on the west side of the campus. This would be a 263,000 square foot facility. Um, it is one of the three primary enabling projects allowing us to move forward with the hospital tower project we've, we've been speaking about. Um, the building itself will host three uh, nationally noted programs at the University of Iowa, our communication sciences and disorders, uh, located currently in the Wendell Johnson Speech and Hearing Building, uh, which is actually on the future footprint of the, uh, the future uh, hospital tower. Uh, health and Human Physiology, currently located in out, outdated and undersized space within the field house, and the largest and fastest growing College of Liberal Arts and Sciences program at the University of Iowa, and then Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Sciences, located within and also undersized within the Medical Education Building, uh, a site that we have identified within our 10-year plan with the Board of Regents for future health science research space. So there are several level, levels of um, coordinated strategy in bringing these together, but one of the key strategies is there are, there are three nationally noted programs <clears throat> currently underserved in their existing spaces now coming together in one building as an enabling project for the hospital project that will benefit all three programs, um, we think vastly, and allow for their both success in teaching and research and clinical work, but also growth and expected growth in those programs. The project budget uh, for this project is $249 million based on uh, construction manager at risk delivery method, which was approved by the board. And um, we will be starting this project this summer um, as, as it would move forward. And in fact, uh, one of the complicating factors, but um, we believe necessary and important is a phasing of this building so that we are able to finish the first portion of the building for the relocation of the Wendell Johnson speech and hearing functions and, and faculty and staff pro and, and student programs so that that site becomes available at the earliest possible date for the hospital tower. We will then finish the second phase of the project for health and human physiology and for physical therapy in the next six to nine months after the completion of CSD space. So that is how we would deliver the project. It will be delivered from a funding perspective with University of Iowa hospitals, um, uh, building usage funds, university treasure temporary investment income, and um, facilities court bond proceeds. We do also view all three of these programs notable enough and the building and project notable enough to draw philanthropic support. And we have begun and will continue to um, 
advance that for all three programs and for this building with the hope of lightening the funding load for those individual funding sources as we go. I'd be glad to answer any questions on that before I move forward. You do have in your uh, packet of information additional information and images related to the renderings of that project, the floor plan of that project. Um, uh, quite, quite a change to that part of campus and, and to the programs associated. You'll also see roughly $11.5 million in existing deferred maintenance, uh, what we'd call immediate buy-down by the elimination of the buildings associated with this project. Does anybody have a uh, Regent Kramer? Yeah. Uh, this is Regent Kramer. Can you get a little breakdown of that planning, design, and management number, that $28 million? How does that kind of split between those things yeah in all of in all of our projects uh, we have a combination of large buckets that relate to the project total they are the construction costs if it's a design bid build project that's the bid day results of the bids so the expected bid day results and then we have contingencies that are within the project for construction contingencies depending on the complications that might be related to either a greenfield project or for instance in addition to a historic building where we can discover a lot more and those percentages might go up for that individual project and then the design and management fees uh, in the in the broadest terms the University of Iowa manages all of the projects through the design process is managing the consultants that are on these teams and in a project of this scale large team and teams of consultants as well as the construction management of the project and and those fees also include the warranty periods which are typically one to two years after a project is done. We continue to manage that project through the warranty period. That is a f um, generally a 5% management fee. As we go up higher into higher cost projects like this, we work with the funding sources to make that a manageable fee that is often less than uh, 5%, but one that can cover the costs for design and construction for the project. And then the balance of that primarily is related to our design consultant fees. And um, that would be, on a project like this, a wide range of design consultants. Sometimes it's really just the architects and engineers for a, a smaller project. We have, um, we have clinic space. We have research space within this building. Um, and, and, and the scale of the project obviously increases that. But uh, those are the major buckets that make up the, the um, design and, and management fees related to a project. Would you mind maybe getting to me after the meeting, kind of a breakdown of, of how it gets to the 28 million? Certainly. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, I, I don't have those specific numbers with me right now, but within all of our projects, we have established over the years what is referred to as Build UI. It's, an, uh, it's a um, homegrown and been very effective, now web-based system we have for managing our projects from the timing uh, notes, collection of all details and documents, and the budget line by line for all of the items. So every one of them is split out, and we make sure for our, if you will, customer base, the, the user groups, the funding sources, every line can be explained and understood. So absolutely, we can, we can show you the breakdown of those costs so that they're fully understood. Okay. And one more, is the uh, construction number then 192? Is that, uh, I assume that's probably not the guaranteed max yet, or yet not at that point yet? No, it, it, we do have guaranteed maximum price and packages for this. One of the first things we'll do on this project is the site and the foundation systems. I think one of the uh, advantages or beauties of a CM at risk project for a major project is it does allow us, if time matters, and time does in construction, it allows us with enough knowledge within the schematic design level of the project to establish the foundation and, if you will, the shape of, of the building, the scale of the building. That allows a guaranteed maximum price establishment for that portion of the project, allowing the construction, the, the con the construction manager at risk and their subcontractors to receive bids from those subcontractors and start that phase of work while we, working with them, are still designing the interiors and other elements. But we will have more to, to reveal with respect to the um, guaranteed maximum price on interior packages as those come further. And that allows us to expedite the completion of this project. Um, 
straight lining from from design to the end of construction of those final phases. And since I'm new, is that is that something that we will see as we go along? Absolutely, so we'll, we'll continue. And, and as we have indicated to the board, with with the gravity of the health science projects that we have, starting with the January 2022 presentation of the master plan, not only of the hospital complex, but also the main campus. Uh, our commitment to the board and our plan is to bring back to you and regularly update both through the committees, the health science and, and, and the hospital UIHC committee, but here the updates on these projects. And, and we intend to bring you know positive updates on the progress and timing of the project as well. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I just, I just want to make a comment. I appreciate when you put in the annual operating and routine maintenance costs and where that money will come out of yeah, the new building. Uh, so, so thank you. Absolutely. We, we have, yeah, the operating costs for the project are something that are borne by the users of, of the project, the colleges that, that support those elements. And when we have a mixed-use building, in this case, um, uh, space within the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, space within the Carver College of Medicine, uh, they will share in the annual operating costs for that project as a general expense for the university. And uh, we also include... Uh, within our budget model for new buildings, new square footage like this, a one and a half percent uh, ongoing renewal cost. That's not annual cost. That's the aging of projects that we've talked about before, the, the cycle of renewal needed on a project. And if you don't invest in that from the onset, you don't have it when you need it. So in this case, when we add a new building um, to our campus, that's something that all of the campus participates in the one and a half percent and so it's important as we establish projects for all 12 colleges and the operational units to understand the story behind the need for a new building it actually i believe puts um, a sharper point on scrutinizing new square footage because it is a shared responsibility not just by that unit but by everyone so we don't take lightly adding new square footage uh, to the campus because all participate in that long-term renewal responsibility very good thank you any other questions okay Hearing none, we'll move on to the next one. Very good. The second project, a little bit smaller, is a, uh, a renewal project and a maintenance project at our uh, Raby Mossman Business Services building. This is just south of um, south of the University of Iowa campus and, and at the south end of Iowa City. It's a facility that serves several of our units associated with the, uh, the basic services of the campus, including surplus and general stores, campus mail, printing departments. Um, the building is one that um, has uh, aging systems. The building was originally built in 1953. It certainly serves the needs of all of those functions effectively, and they don't need to be on the main campus. But in this case, many of the air handlers are well past their age of replacement, some of them non-operational, some of them misplaced, as it's described, inside the building rather than outside. And so we need to um, replace those that are in need and then also replace the roof. This is a um, $3.25 million project funded by Building Services Renewal and Improvement Funds. We This would be roughly a nine-month project. We would start this fall and finish late spring of next year. Any questions on this? The, what's the availability of these air handling units? I know that lead times can be long on th items like this. Or yeah, it can be. It continues to be a challenge for us. And when I say next spring, of course, we, one of the things we have made a pattern of in projects like this that are dominated by that element, and by the way, roofing systems are another challenge from a, a, lead, uh, a, a lead time perspective. Some of those lead time matters are starting to level out some. I was in conversation with many of our peers recently about us seeing some of the leveling out of lead time issues. Um, uh, it's it's um, uh, workforce issues in construction that are becoming the bigger issue at hand. In this case, a, an equipment dominated project, we know what is needed there so we can start the ordering early. And, and that will be a benefit for us to get those in. But we are, like so many others, sort of prisoner to the actualities of, of the lead times. And it's, it's not a simple matter, and it's not one that um, 
works in our favor as we're as we're planning these projects and it does extend some of the timeline but this timeline is based on our expected it would have been shorter five or six years ten years ago um, this is based on the expected lead times for those air handling units as far as occupying the building it's that that's not a problem if not a problem a no bit, it, yeah. it isn't a problem we will uh, it will continue to function there are I believe it's 11 air handlers that have to be replaced they can be replaced in serial we'll keep the building operating as we would um, do the do the work that we're going to do any other questions okay thank you yeah thank you Okay, next, uh, David Geft. Uh, thank you very much. We'll turn that on here. Um, the University of Iowa is requesting uh, the approval to transfer um, 185 acres of land that is in uh, Coralville at our sort of blended research park in, in Oakdale campus from the Board of Regents to the University of Iowa Research Park uh, Corporation. Um, currently, um, there is a long-term master ground lease between um, the Board of Regents and the Research Park Corporation that's been in existence since the park was founded in the late 1980s. Then in turn, in order for the Research Park Corporation to work with private sector to, um, you know, to develop facilities on the park, um, the Research Park Corporation has to then, the only option it has is to sub-ground lease land to third-party developers. And it's become a challenge in really companies wanting to go with that model. It's, it's hard enough to, for them to get interested in a ground lease, but then when it's a sub-ground lease with the state of Iowa as the underlying property owner, it just becomes very cumbersome and challenging. Um, it's difficult for finance companies to put any sort of a, you know, a mortgage or a lien against the property because the underlying ground is, is state property. And so um, uh, we think that by having the property in the name of the Research Park Corporation rather than the Board of Regents, it will give um, the flexibility that I think we need now to uh, make this a much more successful bioscience research um, campus. Uh, there's... Um, uh, we, we've seen this recently uh, during COVID. There was a national search done by a large um, uh, vaccine uh, development company that, it, that was looking at land in the Iowa City area. We put together a very robust um, package with the Iowa City, uh, Iowa City Area Development Group, and um, we ended up getting shortlisted and, and getting to be a finalist, but it ended up going to, uh, to Manhattan, Kansas. And part of the feedback we received was that, the, that delivery model, they wanted to own um, you know, the, the, the ground that they were gonna build a, you know, an $85 million facility on. And so um, again, this will give us the, the research park, the ability to continue to ground lease if that's what um, works best or continue to you know, sell property if that what is what works best. And um, by, by changing this, um, sort of the underlying ownership, um, it gives us that flexibility. The Research Park Corporation is fully controlled by the university, our chief innovation officer, the university's provost, the chief financial officer, um, myself, all sit on that Research Park Corporation, uh, along with some private sector folks, the um, city manager of the city of Coralville. And so it's, it's um, it's not as if there's, there's uh, a lack of control over how this land would be, would be you know, either leased or sold in, into the future. In addition, as we um, you know, continue to make a uh, significant investment with the hospital um, facility in, in uh, North Liberty, which is almost across the street from this, we think there's gonna be continued interest and investment in this area. We just would like to have that more flexibility it aligns with how Iowa State's Research Park operates, uh, that the, their land is owned by uh, the Research Park, their Research Park Corporation, uh, and not by the Board of Regents. Um, and we'd ask for your consideration in making this transfer. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Yeah, Regent Kramer. Uh, this is Regent Kramer. Do you, uh, what do you do with the proceeds if you were to sell the land? Um, the proceeds would go into the, the Research Park Corporation and then be distributed, um, you know, accordingly from that based on um, you know, the university's need and the Research Park's 
need for that property. Some of it just goes back into the investment of managing the park. We have a staff that manages the park and, and goes into that. Um, currently, that those proceeds are ground lease payments, that, and, and that is how that, that functions. It goes back into um, both the university and to the Research Park Corporation um, accounts. And, and are there specific rules of if you were to sell it, um, are there any restrictions on that, or how does how is that corporation kind of um, managed? Yeah, the well, one of the restrictions um, that we will be developing more more intensely are the covenants about what could go on that park. You know, it's not a um, we don't want to be competing with you know just a general office park. We we have a, a mission that the research park corporation has. Um, the park corporation itself is set up as a land holding company. It's a tax, tax exempt land holding company. Um, and uh, we, we certainly are look, looking to make this much more of a um, biocentric uh, campus. Doesn't mean that we aren't interested in having things like, you know, daycare or other amenities, you know, on the park. But the primary mission is to not be competing with the private sector as far as um, just general office buildings, but to but really trying to attract um, regional and national um, biotech firms to the, to the facility. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, David. Thank you, Rod. Thank you. Iowa State. Good morning, committee. Um, today I'm um, bringing to you two requests, capital requ uh, project requests for the Morin Union second and third floor remodel and also the Kildee Hall um, air handling and ventilator uh, unit replacement. Um, so to start off on the first project, um, we're seeking to basically combine the previously approved budget for a second floor and third floor. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is that uh, it helps us in both blending both of these projects into one single project, and that the benefits would be the economy of scale by utilizing a single contractor and consolidating schedules. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a reminder, what was previously approved, it was for the second floor project, was to give students an enlarged um, space to meet with friends, the dining use, uh, extended food store uh, services. On the third floor, we'll be providing uh, new offices, uh, conference rooms, and also a collaborator space uh, for student programs, student success programs, to meet the needs of the student uh, needs. Um, this schedule would start this summer and will be completed by fall 2024. There is no budget increase, uh, so all we're doing is really combining this together, and the uh, sources will still be the same of university funds and memorial union funds. Uh, so with that, are there any questions about that? Any questions? All right. Okay. I'll, I'll, <laughs> All right. Uh, the second one is Kildee Hall. Um, this one, um, it, we're requesting to revise the budget uh, to $2.3 million, um, which it was approved at $1.5 million. Uh, in May 2023, uh, we received four competitive bids for the construction contract, but all exceeded the budget estimate. Uh, we felt that this is due to construction of cost of inflation, as we're experiencing in this project. Um, to let you know, the heating and cooling system is about 58 years old, um, dating back to 1965. I wasn't even born, just to let you know. <laughs> All, uh, you, was. you was born? Okay. You can tell me about it a little bit more. <laughs> um, all six of the KLD primary air and hair units, including two units, are well beyond its useful life in regular repairs. Uh, the project will be the first series of renovation projects to replace these aging units. Uh, starting with air handling um, and ventilator units, which serve laboratories, laboratory space, space support. Additionally, the room, additionally, this room will locate it, be located for future air handling unit replacements, including upgrade to motor control centers, control panels, rip, uh, relocating electronic formers, and also improving the f uh, future operations and maintenance. Uh, this project will start in the summer, this summer, and be completed by fall 2025. And again, this uh, funding will still use uh, our overhead use facility fund and our capital renewal funds um, will cover the $2.3 million budget, revised budget. Yeah, Regent Kramer. 
are you were you able to then award it to that low bidder, or did you have to reject all bids and rebid the thing? We will have to go back and uh, rebid it. Okay. I assume there's some efficiencies that will be gained from a system that's that old. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think people will care for it when the weather is hot or cold, right? Um, especially cold because I'm new here, and cold has been something of the <laughs> essence of it. <so. laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. I think you're still yes, going. I'm still yeah, uh, you're still going. <laughs> Right. Um, so this one uh, request is a uh, naming facility. Um, Iowa State is requesting a board approval to name the academic building of the veterinarian uh, medicine complex. It's the Frederick Douglass Patterson Hall in honor of Dr. Frederick Douglass Patterson. The ISU College of Veterinary Medicine sought and received feedback and support for this proposed naming from campus leaders, students, faculty, staff, and alumni, and other stakeholders. The President Advisory Committee on Naming University Property reviewed and recommended this proposal of Dr. Patterson's family descendants and likewise supportive. Just to give you a little bit of history of this, in 1923, Patterson was the first African American to graduate from Iowa State's College of Veterinary Medicine. He earned a master's degree at Iowa State and a PhD from Cornell University. Before embarking on his distinguished career in academia and public service, his professional accomplishments include, and you should have this in front of you, but I will kind of sum it up as I was reading this to my daughter last night, and she was very excited to hear about this, and I told her to go do some more research on Google. So <laughs> uh, the things that I told her is that he was the president of Tuskegee University at the age of 34 years old and was the founder of the vet Veterinary Medicine and Engineering College. Uh, he was the founder of the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, if you would know, um, and also was the co-founder of the United Negro College Fund which has raised over $5 billion in scholarship for academic, uh, African American students. Uh, he was the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom of our nation's highest civilian award, honor, awarded in uh, 1987 by President Ronald Reagan, which I was uh, born for that. <laughs> uh, Patterson is the only veterinarian and one of the three Iowa State alumni to receive this award. Um, you can see in your, the the pictures of the floor, the floor plans. If you look at the highlighted portions of the vet, uh, veterinary medicine complex proposed for the naming, this encompasses the classrooms, uh, administrative and also academic offices, research labs, library, main entrance, common space um, that you can see in the graphics. The naming portion would exclude the Lloyd Veterinary and Medical Center, the new veterinary and diagnostic lab uh, laboratory facilities that y'all toured when y'all were with us in uh, Ames, uh, the Veterinarian Field Service Building, the Veterinarian Medicine Research Institute, and the associate outing buildings. This proposal does not include naming the college, any department, or any academic programs. Thank you, and if you have any questions. Any questions? This is really pretty neat. I think it adds to the pedigree of the school when you have somebody with this type of a pedigree and there's only 700 people or so that have received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, for example, and with that type of a pedigree, the students show up and they wonder who this person might be and they'll Google it and say, wow, I had no idea. So it's really neat to, to do yeah. this, so yeah. Okay, next item. Still up, huh? <laughs> All right, um, property transfer. Uh, this one is uh, we're requesting to transfer about 0.6 acres from, IS, uh, from ISU to Iowa Department of Transportation. Um, the Iowa DOT is uh, seeking to obtain this 33.6 acre of the property to expand their existing right away of for US Highway 69 to allow repairs of a bridge crossing on Walnut Creek. The bridge is located approximately about four miles from south of Ames. Uh, the land is currently part of the Iowa State University Animal Resource Station. The request land transfer does not con conflict with any of the current use of the uh, university or the future plans for this property. Construction for this will be uh, participate. I mean, <laughs> we're anticipated to start in the spring 2024 and be completed by fall 2024. 
Uh, as this is an interagency transfer property, uh, Iowa DOT would not pay for the land. However, they will reimburse us for any uh, for the required modification for a fence. So, um, and then the final uh, agreement and interagency transfer of this jurisdiction would be subject to review by the university and board council before uh, signature by the executive director. Any questions about that? Questions? Okay, thank you. We're, we're back to David now. Thank you. Uh, University of Iowa is requesting uh, several easements and right of way conveyances for roadways related to our North Liberty new um, um, hospital complex. Um, just a, a quick summary that project is going uh, extremely well. We're a little over 30% uh, complete. Um, if you watch the uh, the webcam uh, that some of us like go to like daily and kind of see what's what's happening, um, the uh, precast panels, especially on the um, south side, are going up. The building is being closed. All the MEP work inside the building is um, is is moving along well. The, we've had a you know mild winter, a sort of mild spring, and a great summer so far. So the project is uh, is progressing uh, quite nicely. Uh, and so what, what is before you today is sort of a standard uh, development um, easements and right-of-ways that would occur uh, anywhere uh, uh, around a development of this size. Um, for those of, of you unfamiliar with what this originally looked like, this was uh, for decades just a uh, corn and soybean field uh, with no utilities running to it. And so what is uh, asking for approval are, are standard um, easements to um, uh, to Mid-Am, uh, Lynn County Rural Electric, uh, uh, the City of um, um, North Liberty uh, for utilities around the property. And then in addition, um, uh, traffic studies that have been conducted um, show that uh, Forever Green needs uh, sort of a dedicated turn lane uh, into the, um, especially the area around where that main boulevard will come off of, of Forever Green Road right into the the, the center of the hospital complex. And so to do that, we'll be um, uh, uh, conveying some property to the city of North Liberty for them to widen um, Forever Green Road and to um, put in that dedicated turn line. And to the south of the property, when we first started construction, uh, we dedicated uh, the, uh, some land on the, um, uh, just to the south of the property complex for the extension of Wheaton Road. Uh, which serves as a secondary access from the south into the into the property we'll be extending that all the way over to jones boulevard uh, for future phases and again that that will be another access point into the hospital complex primarily in the south will be where staff parks and so uh, folks will not be coming in the main entrance but will be coming in off of wheaton road if you're if you're a staff parking um, in that area and it's a um, uh, half the roadway from center line north would be conveyed by us and then the private development to the south would convey the other half of, of, of the roadway. Happy to answer any questions. And that to Coralville. This site, as you know, yeah. is pinned right between Coralville and North Liberty. So in the north half, we're talking North Liberty, south, south section or this portion, Coralville. Correct. Any questions? <coughs> okay, you. I believe we are planning a tour of the North Liberty site for our September meetings. So yes, we're looking forward. We will to get that. A yeah, we love to go we see love that. giving tours. So <laughs> I think it's a it's great timing. That project will have advanced to a point where we can visit multiple floors. We can see enclosure, and you'll get a great view. It's always interesting to have those hard hat views, but a great view of the progress on that project. And it is, as David said, going very well. Good. Thank you. Thanks, um, Sean. You're back up. Yes. Welcome back. Um, so uh, this request that we're asking for the board approval uh, is for an easement um, in our, our research uh, park area. Um, so what we're doing is that we're asking for un three underground utility easements from our three ISU affiliates to expand underground data fiber, um, fiber connections to the ISU research and teaching farms three miles south of Central Campus. All holdings property titles along the proposed easement Routes to the three ISU affiliates are the Committee for Agriculture and Development, Iowa State University Foundation, Iowa State University Research Park. 
The three easements will complete a loop from the animal science re uh, teaching and research farm along State Avenue to the west of Iowa State University Research Park to the east. The underground data fiber would be installed in two phases, providing high-speed data to multiple ISU research and teaching f facilities, including the IS ISU Ag 450 farm and ISU daily da uh, Dairy Farm. Uh, working has already begun on the first phase, which is on the ISU uh, property. Uh, this easement would be negotiated with the Committee for Agriculture Development, the ISU University Foundation, and the ISU University Research Park, Iowa State University. Uh, and this will be reviewed by the university and the board council before approval by the executive director of the Board of Regents of the State of Iowa. Any questions? Questions on this one? Okay. Uh, hearing none, we'll recommend all these projects and namings, et cetera, to the board. Uh, any other items uh, that should come before this committee today? Okay. Well, with that, this meeting of the Property and Facilities Committee is adjourned for today. Okay, in the interest of staying on time, welcome to the new academic, or re, uh, I should say reconstituted Academic Affairs Committee. As noted in the bylaws uh, revision for the regents, uh, there are now three uh, regents assigned to each committee as voting members. It's my pleasure to chair the committee. Regent Barker will be vice chair, and Regent Crow is the third voting member. Pardon me. Do we lose somebody? Oh, yeah. She'll be here, I'm yeah. sure. Okay. Um, representatives from the universities and the board office will always participate in the meetings as well, and all board members are welcome to sit in and participate in the meetings. We'll begin with our business today. Our first item uh, is approval of the Academic Affairs Committee meeting from April. Are there any changes needed for, for those minutes? Hearing none, these, these minutes are approved by general consent. Item two, uh, our first new business is a request for new programs at UNI Provost Herrera. Uh, will you tell us about these requests? Thank you. Um, thank you, Regent Linda Meyer. I'm going to have uh, Associate Provost uh, Patrick Pease. Uh, thank you, Regent Linda Meyer. Uh, we have two program proposals, and I'm happy to uh, kind of present them together because they are uh, connected and uh, they're linked with a common core. Uh, so the first, the BS in Material Science Engineering uh, that we're proposing is an interdisciplinary major that takes advantage of existing faculty expertise in material science from three of our departments, Applied Engineering and Technical Management, Chemistry and Biochemistry, and Physics. The program will emphasize the properties of metal, which is a core strength of the Department of Applied Engineering and Technical Management, and it will leverage our foundry science uh, facilities and the resources of our new Applied Engineering building set to open next year. 
Uh, this is a 90 credit major with 47 uh, credit hours in a uh, material science and engineering core uh, curriculum and the remaining credits comprised of advanced math, chemistry, and physics courses. Uh, the core courses uh, are shared with its sister program, the Material Science Engineering Technology Program, which is the second one on the list. So the proposed BS in Material Science Engineering Technology uh, will be offered in tandem to provide a broad-based access to material science, engineering, and technology instruction at UNI. This technology program will share the core curriculum with the engineering program, but then takes a more applied, industry-based, and manufacturing approach leveraging our existing facilities and strength in metal casting and additive and subtractive manufacturing, especially in the areas of metal. Uh, this new major will require 74 credit hours, which includes that shared core curriculum between the two. Together, these programs will build on the existing expertise and facilities UNI has in metal casting and manufacturing technology in the Applied Engineering and Technical Management Department and in material science in physics and chemistry and biochemistry. Uh, UNI's Metal Casting Center and the Foundry 4.0 Center housed in tech, tech Works are cutting edge facilities for materials preparation and characterization and positions the program to meet the workforce needs in the state of Iowa and industry across the nation. Uh, faculty and facilities in physics and chemistry and biochemistry provide an interdisciplinary perspective, expertise in metal science, and access to laboratories for chemical analysis and characterization, electron microscopy, and spectroscopy. Both programs will seek ABET accreditation. Uh, the program creators met with engineering representatives from both Iowa State University and University of Iowa. Both groups provided helpful feedback, which was adopted and appreciated. Sorry. Are there any questions? Okay, hearing none. So the next item uh, has to do with uh, restructuring uh, our existing programs, and I'll also uh, introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Pease to talk a little bit more about the restructuring. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about these as well. Again, the, the next two are linked and connected. Uh, so we're proposing, the first is a, a school, the development of a school. Uh, we're proposing the consolidation of our existing health-related programs into a school of health and human sciences. This project has been developing for several, ye several years and emerges from uh, faculty-led initiatives focused on the academic programs and structures at our institution. Uh, the school will be housed in our College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and it will bring together existing programs that currently span multiple colleges. The purpose is to improve coordination and to help prospective students find the career options that they're, they're looking for. This administrative change will have uh, no new programming except for the nursing major, which was approved by this body last November and will launch in fall of 2024. Uh, as such, changes will have a minimal but positive impact on current students. No majors are being eliminated and all students will be able to continue uninterrupted in their programs. The school will, however, help build new affinities among the students and help them practice needed competencies in interpersonal communications and collaboration. Currently, as I mentioned, the health-related programs at UNI are housed in multiple colleges with minimal coordination. So bringing them together into a single school will help students find new connections, networks, and better prepare them for a wider range of uh, careers, options within the health fields. The changes to our administrative and advising structures will also reduce redundancies, improve efficiencies, and enhance the student experience. The programs that will make up this new school include the Department of Family, Aging, and Counseling, which includes programs in family services, gerontology, mental health counseling, and school counseling. The Department of Kinesiology, which includes programs in athletic training and exercise science the Department of Social Work, and a new Department of Nursing and Public Health, which brings us to the second part of the, the proposal that's on the agenda. 
So we're also seeking to create a Department of Nursing and Public Health. Nursing is a newly approved program at UNI, which, again, we plan to launch formally in fall of 2024 once the curriculum and facilities are fully in place. Uh, beginning to build the department to house that program at this time will ensure that we have the supports in place at the time students start the programs. Public health is an existing uh, uh, program at UNI currently housed in our College of Education, and they're excited about the transition into both a new department and a new school. Making public health part of the new department will highlight those programs and increase visibility for prospective students by aligning them with related health career fields. Bringing nursing and public health together will also allow for increased efficiencies with shared courses, streamlined advising, and streamlined administrative services. The programs also offer a natural fit with their mutual focus on promoting well-being and enhancing an overall quality of life. So again, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Patrick or Jose? These are exciting changes and additions to the university, I think. I think well uh, needed and well suited for the state of Iowa. Thank you. Yeah, we're very excited. The committee will recommend approval of the request to create a school of health and human services and a department of nursing and public health at the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, with that, item four, um, Provost Wickert has uh, a request for a program termination at Iowa State University, I believe. Yes, thank you, Regent Lindenmeyer. Iowa State University requests approval by the board to terminate our Bachelor of Science degree in biophysics, which is offered through our uh, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. This really represents the fact that the discipline uh, has changed since the uh, inception of this uh, degree. Uh, in the early days, the focus was uh, in the area of, uh, of more mechanical behavior of the body, muscles, musculature, movement, and so forth. The discipline has changed from those macroscopic scale uh, characteristics to chemistry and molecular scale um, uh, behavior in, in biological systems. So because the discipline has changed, um, we're seeking this uh, uh, termination. Uh, enrollments in this program in the past several years, as you see in the docket item, have typically been, been low. Completions uh, have been low. Uh, we've met with students uh, currently in the program, and uh, as is our standard practice, any student currently in the biophysics program will be allowed to complete it. Students that may have expressed interest in it uh, will be um, uh, given the opportunity to move into other uh, areas. Uh, the um, existing degree, which will continue in biochemistry, will uh, uh, continue to have a pathway in it for students who may be interested in the more uh, macroscopic scale biological uh, characteristics. Uh, no courses or faculty uh, in the department will be eliminated uh, since this uh, pathway for the biochemistry major will uh, remain. Um, and uh, the, any uh, cost savings from this change will really be uh, a minimal. Uh, this really represents more of a, a streamlining and uh, efficiency uh, in the uh, curriculum. It's received all the necessary uh, internal approvals and uh, would take uh, immediate, uh, in effect immediately upon uh, approval by the board. Any questions for Provost Wickert? This won't, will not result in any staffing changes then? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If there are no objections or questions, the committee will recommend approval of the request for termination of the Bachelor of Science in Biophysics at Iowa State University. Um, item five is a recommendation from the American School for the Deaf. Um, agreement and Rachel Boone will be handling this presentation. Thank you, Regent Lindemeyer. Um, this request is really for the board to ratify um, an agreement that Iowa School for the Deaf has entered into with American School for the Deaf to provide instruction um, in one or two key curricular areas. This is actually an extension of an agreement that the board ratified a year ago when um, ISD was dealing with the teacher shortage issue. Um, they were very happy with how this went um, over the last year and are, are asking to extend that agreement for one year. Superintendent Cool is here and could take any questions from anybody um, regarding the agreement. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll recommend approval of that recommendation. Um, at this time, we welcome presenters from all three universities who will speak to us about artificial intelligence. 
Joining us will be Dr. Barrett Thomas from the University of Iowa, Dr. Jim O'Laughlin from the University of Northern Iowa, and Dr. Abram Anders from Iowa State University. Okay, we need to arrange for some slides here. I think they're up, so you all just might want to turn. Okay, them. you got them. All right. You can proceed anytime. Thank you. Well, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for having us. It's not every day that we get the opportunity as faculty to speak on a world-changing technology uh, like generative AI. Uh, I am Abram Anders. I'm an associate professor of English and the interim associate director for the Student Innovation Center at Iowa State University. I'm uh, Jim O'Loughlin. I'm a professor and the head of the Department of Languages and Literatures at the University of Northern Iowa. And I'm Barry Thomas. I'm the uh, Fethke Research Professor in Business Analytics and the Senior Associate Dean in the Tippie College of Business at the University of Iowa. Well, the first thing we'd like to acknowledge is that AI is a, a term that covers a broad range of things. If you go to a computer, computer science department, if you go to industry, you'll see a lot of things. But what we're practically here to talk about today is generative AI, a new class of technologies that bring heretofore impossible uh, ease of use and a scale of use. Generative, generative AI encompasses a wide range of platforms or models and then applications built on those models that can generate text, uh, code, image, uh, speech, video, 3D, and all kinds of other amazing things. And when we think about the impact on education, it's already being illustrated by early pioneers. Here, uh, Ethan Mollick, a Wharton School professor of business, talks about the fact that in his entrepreneurship classes, where in the past students would create a prototype and uh, create an outline for a marketing campaign for a product, now with the power of generative AI, they can build working prototypes. Uh, they can use it to produce text for a marketing campaign and so on, so that the bar is raised for what is possible in educational contexts. But as we talk with you today, we want to focus on one big area. This is the class of these tools that are called large language models. These are the tools that produce text and are known by the brand applications ChatGPT. What are large language models? Uh, well, they are tools that use machine learning techniques to generate human-like text. Uh, the model is trained on a massive amount of text, and this allows it to understand and generate a wide range of language. A key thing to remember here is that the very base model of these tools, what they are doing is simply predicting the single next most likely word. Um, and this helps us dispel um, myths or impressions that these things might be sentient. But at the same time, thanks to the Miracleful Transformer technologies and machine learning, based on that simple mechanic and more on top of it, we have emergent behaviors that allow these tools to do kinds of things we would have never expected. So what are the capabilities of these tools? Well, they really excel at high fluent writing, that is linguistic competence. Uh, but in some cases, they may struggle with uh, tasks that require uh, common sense reasoning or an understanding of the world. The most recent model released earlier this spring, GPT-4, um, has really excelled at doing the types of things that we might expect. For uh, knowledge tests where we have established domains of knowledge, well documented, well understood, they can do extremely well. But even though we can see these magical-like performance of these tools, it's really important to know that they have limitations. They're not sentient. They don't think and feel like a human does. They're not objective. They are um, likely to have some of the same biases of the human language that they're trained on. They're not authoritative. Like a human author, they can't be responsible for the consequences of their texts, and they're not ethical. This is why almost all AI experts recommend that humans are in the loop for critical important functions. So now I'd like to turn the floor over and we'll talk a little bit about academic integrity. So there have been a lot of headlines recently about 
uh, issues involving academic integrity and particularly chat GPT, some of, and I think they've raised a number of concerns um, that people have been dealing with. But I think it's worth noting that um, a lot of these issues are not new to us, particularly when it comes to questions of plagiarism. Um, this is just an example of uh, UNI's policy. You can already see in what's underlined there in green that there's already some uh, mechanism for dealing with electronic text, but we are, the section in red, kind of working on what modest changes may need to be made to account for uh, generative AI. But what we realize is that what we'll, what's going to need to happen is actually some fairly flexible policies, and these are from discussions at the um, at Iowa State. Um, there may be contexts where AI would we'd want to discourage and other contexts where we actually need to encourage it. And that could vary from modest uses to very extensive uses. So there are some concerns that a lot of faculty have right now. Electronic plagiarism checkers that are already in place, they've actually struggled to accurately identify AI-produced text, um, particularly a lot of false positives come up for students for whom English is not their first language. But we also are finding now that some standard forms of assessments, things that we all would have done, the take-home exam, the annotated bibliography, the research paper, these are going to become less reliable indicators of student performance because chat GPT can be used with them so easily. Um, and the concern is that students who need to work most to develop some essential skills. This is in, in written communication, argumentation, and understanding the fundamentals of computer coding languages. Um, these students may be most tempted to use AI instead. So clearly there are going to be some circum circumstances and some classes where the use of AI would be detrimental and would need to be prohibitive and faculty would need to have that, the leeway for that. However, it's not that simple because there will be other, many fields, it will be expected that students will come out adept at using this AI technology. The field or the job category of prompt engineer is likely to be a, a, future, a future entry level job for many of our students. So AI will, use will be a requirement in some courses, maybe even some sections of courses where it's being prohibited um, you know, by, other, by other people, and that will depend on what individual faculty are doing. Um, and then importantly, adept users of AI tools are going to need to have the ability to identify what is strong writing, what arguments are persuasive, what is well-drafted code. And as a, someone who comes out of a traditional humanities field, I just want to make a little plug here that um, traditionally education in the humanities had been about an ability to cultivate taste and appreciation for wh what kind of work was well regarded, though more recently a lot of humanities fields have emphasized their abilities to help students develop essential and transferable, transferable skills. Now in the era of AI, discernment, that ability to distinguish what is seen as good and what is seen as bad, what is seen as persuasive from what is seen as unpersuasive, that's actually going to become much more important, and that is something that the humanities teaches. So, I'll turn things over. Yes. So, okay. All right, so we've, we've solved the musical chairs problem. Um, <laughs> and, and so, quite obviously, academic integrity is the most obvious challenge that is before us as universities as we look at these generative AI technologies, but there are some additional um, concerns that, that we should address. And so I want to talk about three of those today, privacy, misinformation, and bias. And I'll take an aside and note the image that I've used on the slide is a puzzle with missing pieces. I asked ChatGPT how it would best describe in an image the challenges uh, associated with AI, and, and this is what it told me to do. And then I went over to another generative technology, DALI, that generates images from human text, and I was able to generate an image of a puzzle missing pieces uh, in order to add that to the presentation. So with regard to privacy, and I think this is particularly important at universities with regard to FERPA as well as to uh, HIPAA situations that we would have on our health campus here at the University of Iowa, and that is that your data isn't private. These companies store any data that you put into a generative technology and they're using that to train the next generation of these technologies. So if you are putting sensitive data in there, that is now stored and used by a third party. There are changes that are coming, particularly in ChatGPT, to allow you to 
um, keep your data private, but I think there are still concerns. And it requires education to make sure that people understand these and probably in certain circumstances, prohibition against um, using these technologies with certain data. In addition, um, as Abram pointed out, these models are making statistical associations. They do not learn facts. And as a result, when you ask a question, um, particularly one that doesn't have a well-documented body of knowledge, such as some of the exams that these technologies have been tested on, you will find that you get responses that might look reasonable, but they simply aren't true. And this particularly comes out in the case of citations with a now infamous example of a lawyer in New York who used ChatGPT to help write a brief and was given case law that simply doesn't exist as references. So the privacy and misinformation are, are really relevant to uh, generative AI such as we're discussing, but more broadly all AI technologies have questions of bias. and. That bias comes in algorithmic design. It comes in how we sample the data that uh, is used to train these models. It comes from the way that data is generated. This is, in these cases, human-generated data. And so the data you get depends on who has access to that, that human generation. And we've also heard that there are questions about how humans use the responses that we're getting out of these systems. So it's important that we are, in all cases, educating our faculty, staff, and students on the use of these technologies, both from the perspective of the opportunity they offer, but also the, the challenges and concerns that they present. The last thing uh, we want to share about uh, these tools is that disruption is already happening now. Uh, these technologies, unlike other technologies, are not emergent in the sense we don't have to wait five years to see what they can do. They can already do it now. And if, if we had no further progress, they would already be transforming our world. Uh, Goldman Sachs predicts 300 million jobs will be changed. The adage here is uh, AI won't replace your job. A human using AI will replace your job. That it's all about how these tools can uh, ramp up human talents. Uh, Christopher Potts, a professor at Stanford, a computational linguist, says that we're 95% of the way with the technical part, but the last 5%, that last mile of innovation, really depends not just on AI, but on domain experts, like those that are in all of our departments and colleges and units at these universities, as well as human-computer interaction and AI experts. So yes, we need prompt engineers, but we also need students who can do prompting for their majors, for their disciplines. And so the disciplines will be more valuable than ever uh, in a world of generative AI. And uh, the last point I think all three of us agree on is the question is not uh, to ban or not to ban. Uh, that's, that's already gone. This is here uh, for good. But how can we assume leadership for inventing ethical futures, ones uh, that mitigate harms in our learning communities and prepare our students to be able to use these tools going forward? Uh, toward that end, we'd like to give a very brief highlight of some uh, innovations we're aware of already. These are happening everywhere across the campus in small places ground up. Um, at the case of Iowa State University, I'm leading uh, this course, a new experimental course in artificial intelligence and writing. I'm really excited to work with students and learn together. What can these tools do well? Where do they fall uh, short? How can we integrate them into workflows like those that you may do in your majors? Along the way, we'll be learning some valuable literacies. Um, how do you create prompts? How do you check for facts? Um, and how do you find the right tool for your use case? Um, really excited to work with students on this project. And then uh, just some examples at, at UNI, um, an epidemiology class where students analyze chat GPT public health information for, for accuracy, um, using chat GPT as a kind of check in a creative writing class to see what kind of ideas would and would not be considered original. And there's some great opportunities for individualized learning as in the example of a, a literature professor who was able to present students with over 30 different types of critical interpretations of a novel that they had read so that each student could respond to those. Um, and so th those are some kind of changes that are, or some innovations that are already happening now. So as we've already seen, the, the opportunities here aren't just in places like computer science or engineering that are inventing these new technologies. It's going to impact 
uh, all of the research across campus, and then also all of our students as they go into the workforce. And it's important that we're preparing them for that space. So the University of Iowa, we're already recognizing that uh, entrepreneurship, for instance, has changed dramatically with ChatGPT 3.5 coming out in November. Uh, all of the venture capital money is really moving into AI. We need to prepare our entrepreneurship students for those opportunities, and we're doing that in a many different ways. But first of all, we have to help them understand what these technologies are and, and what the opportunities are with them. We have to give them hands-on experience, for instance, through our Commercializing New Technology Academy in developing um, new products and services, and then also through partnerships. One that we have in Tippy now is with the Global Insurance Accelerator, where we have a chance to provide entrepreneurship education while also getting a chance for our students to interact with the entrepreneurs who are developing these, these new technologies. It's also then about educating more broadly that, that future workforce, making sure all of our students are at least conversant conceptually in what these technologies can do, and that's across all levels, because it will impact all of them. And then also recognizing, as we have heard, that the students will be using this, so particularly with generative AI and large language models, they'll be using this in their communication, as we have seen. But then there are also things that these technologies don't do, and we need to emphasize those with our students. So for instance, one of the things we've leaned into in the business school is maximizing team performance and making sure that, you know, that we help our students best understand how to maximize what they can do together uh, in teams, because at this point, machines aren't capable of doing that. So thank you all for the opportunity to present uh, to you, and we're available for questions. Any questions? Sure. Dave. Regent Barker. Sure. Well, thanks. Um, on the problem of false information coming from ChatGPT, is, is that something that's likely to be solved fairly soon? I'm thinking of like the Wolfram products that have, you know, they're based on facts and that you combine those things so that ChatGPT can kind of check itself, or is that not the direction it's going? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, it is true that there's a lot of people working on this issue, uh, so they're exploring uh, ways that uh, large language models can fact check themselves when linked to databases. The, the challenge is of confabulation. If you ask it a question that there's not a verifiable fact that can correct it, it will make things up. So I think it's likely to be um, improve, constant, continually improving, but a bit of a chronic problem. I think I heard this say that that is what people do. Right, <laughs> yes. right. So, but as the databases grow, it, that problem will, so that, that problem ought to diminish over time? It, it will certainly, but I think like all knowledge itself, we have established knowledge and we have exploratory areas. Okay. So um, th this is again, I think a truism that we're going to hear over and over again is that we still need humans in the loop and uh, we can get better at the fact checking, but for sensitive uh, cutting edge areas, we'll always need people. Okay. And on humans in the loop, you were, another problem you were talking about was bias. So, okay, so the system itself can be biased in some ways, but when you put humans in the loop, those humans have their own biases and will push the system in a direction they want to. So it's not really a solvable problem, is it? Yeah, I think humans have bias, so they can compound the bias that, that's coming out of that. But at the same time, you know, humans can also recognize, you know, that the output or the, the machine learning models themselves have bias. And so, um, you know, depending on what that user wants to do with that, um, you know, they can, they can have a supporting role or a, you know, magnifying role, I think. Regent Ricewick. Thanks. Uh, we talk about how the students might interact with it and making sure they understand this. Is there, should we also consider how professors or educators might interact with this too, such as creating a syllabus, for example, or course content that they're going to deliver in, the, in their classes so that they're taking a similar approach so they don't end up like the attorney in New York. That, I hadn't heard that before. I, thought, I can't believe somebody would actually do that without checking, checking it. Yeah. I, I think, you know, just from the examples I can give from what we're doing in our college is that we have a staff member who is looking at, across these technologies and all of the new emerging technologies with regard to 
um, you know, ways in which we might use this. So one, one option, right, is that these technologies are capable of reading the essays that our students write, and could those, could they then be a first line to help you know, grade, particularly as it relates to grammar and, you know, syntax and, and other things. And I think that's true. But again, this comes back to some of these questions. We, this is where that human has to come into the loop because they're not infallible. And so we need to be working, you know, with faculty and training faculty on these um, opportunities. And in the same way, if you were to generate a syllabus, um, you know, the output you get is going to depend on the input that these models had. Um, and right now we're seeing, you know, models from OpenAI, which is supported by Microsoft or BARD from Google, but there's also an emerging set of open source models. So you're going to have to be careful to know, you know, what's the, what's kind of the data sets that are behind these models, because it's going to get to the point where, you know, a lot of different people are going to be able to train their own models and you not, won't necessarily know what's coming out of the back end. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity as we showed, but it's going to require as well a lot of education to make sure we appropriately use the technology. Well, Regent oh, Bates. I have a question. You know, we listen a lot to the employers and what they want in our students when they graduate. Do you hear this, that more knowledge about AI? Is there fear also as from them as to what AI can do or not do? I do think that it would not be surprising that the employers might be expecting new hires to be more familiar with this than people who are already there and who to come in with the, in kind of the way that um, with social media, uh, social media tools, um, it was ex oftentimes new employers with the people who knew most about that and then took that on. I think something similar will likely happen with AI. I could speak to that briefly. Um, one of the things, we've already seen studies that show that for everyday knowledge worker tasks, emails, reports, this kind of thing, uh, generative AI can make uh, great employees more productive and uh, weak employees good. Um, and so we're going to see a lot of use. But employers uh, just saw an op-ed today by one of my colleagues saying employers are asking, we need training, we need to figure out how we can responsibly use these. And one of the big issues is intellectual property, right? We've already heard right. Samsung's trying to spin up their own version of, of chat GPT so they don't have to worry about that. So I think in the long term, academic and industry organizations are going to be really paying attention to how can we create versions of these things that are trained on our data that we can protect and that right. we can own. So the more we know, the more we aren't going to know and need yeah. to find out. Yeah. Thank you. Regent Barker, follow. You mentioned grading. Um, they could, it could go beyond grammar and syntax, right? And so would they feed in A papers, B papers, C papers, train the models on that and so that eventually they kind of know what's an A paper and, and replace graders altogether? I, I mean, it's possible. So, for instance, over the winter break, um, staff and faculty who work in our Frank Communication Center in the College of Business uh, entered the prompts for some of their assignments into ChatGPT and then assessed the essays that came out using the rubrics that we use. And it, those, they found that the essays that were coming out of ChatGPT were, you know, B and C level um, papers. So it's not hard to imagine that you could then reverse that and have it reading papers. You know, there's questions of the rubrics that you use, the what we want to emphasize in our own education, and I think we're probably a ways away from those technologies being able to incorporate all of that and, again, take the, the human um, out of the loop. But um, ultimately, these technologies will certainly have the capability to, you know, to grade all together, right? And, uh, you know, one of the other concerns right now is that there are new technologies, for instance, that can, um, are browser plugins, and when you go and you do um, an online quiz, which we use often now in Canvas, uh, those technologies, they certainly can help you answer multiple choice and short answer questions. So, you know, just as we can then auto grade based on you know those online quizzes, now they have technology. So it's it's that constant battle that we have um, with with new technology, uh, you know, throughout the history. I had one more. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned the teaching that you're doing on AI. What kind of research 
uh, are your institutions involved in on, on these technologies? I think there's a lot of things happening in the domains where technolo uh, these technologies are involved. As a general purpose research tool, you know, there's tremendous opportunity here. There's tools that can help uh, faculty uh, discover literature that might be relevant to a research question, uh, to summarize it, to break it down and trail, uh, follow the method. There's all kinds of tools that are ramping up our ability to do both quantitative and qualitative analysis. So as a general purpose research tool, these things are fantastic and they're gonna be accelerating productivity. Well, I'm thinking more of our, our people, our, our people at our institutions pushing the frontiers of artificial intelligence also in what sorts of- oh, Yes, of course. Um, I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues, but I can mention the computer science d department at Iowa State is just, they're doing amazing things. I've been attending their talks. It, it's hard to summarize, but yes, absolutely. Uh, they're doing all kinds of amazing work right now. And, you know, I can give specific examples from my experience in analytics where we are, are trying to develop new technologies just like they do in computer science. And in my own discipline, which focuses on um, vehicle routing and last mile delivery, you know, for years we've done routing using very sophisticated mathematical optimization tools. But the same technology that underlies ChatGPT, the, the attention technology, which are the probabilities that, that Abram was showing you, can also help you to generate sequences of stops for a vehicle. So this is transforming then how we even think about as we apply what we're doing in these large language models to additional domains that can change how we think about the automation of that kind of decision making as well. So I think overall it's going to impact every discipline. We just see that you know, Google's DeepMind has just released in, in the last couple of months both uh, a machine learned technique for doing faster matrix multiplication, which is the mathematics that underlies all kinds of you know, different computations, as well as a, a faster sorting algorithm that is, you know, again, is, is an underpinning of computer science. So these technologies are, are going to permeate all of the disciplines, whether it's computer science or analytics, um, it's going to be accounting, it's going to be finance, we're going to see it in chemistry, it's already impacting biology, digital humanities. Um, so I think that, you know, all of our faculty are, um, you know, certainly, th I think, thinking about these technologies and the things that we can do to help them, you know, get up to speed so that we're all at the, continue to be at the forefront of our fields. One of the impressions I get from watching national news on this or reading about it is that the industry leaders are frightened by the speed of, of the development of, of this technology and they're calling for government regulation. Uh, and I'm sure you've talked through internal, maybe uh, controls is the wrong word, but internal considerations that you, that you have to talk through. What, what's your opinion on that, on the, on the considerations of control and government intervention on the regulation? So this is all, all developing pretty quickly. In fact, just today I saw that the European Parliament had just uh, begun the process of issuing some type of regulations. Um, so I think we're all a little cautious about uh, committing to any particular path, knowing that the ground could change on, on that going forward. Uh, I will say that there is a recent uh, report put out by the Government Education Office, and it, it sort of emphasizes this idea of the human in the loop with regard to protecting student data, with regard to, you know, if we think about using these tools as an assistant for grading, making sure that a grade a student receives is explainable, understandable, it's connected to their work, it's not just going into a mystery box. Uh, so I think with respect to academic uses, we're really gonna be looking at a lot of policies that will come through experience. And I think that's why it's vital for faculty to get in, uh, get their hands into these tools and, and kind of figure out what are, what are the flaws, the shortcomings, where are the ethical cruxes that we may wanna develop policies for in the future. Thank you, I have a feeling we'll be talking about this some more <laughs> in the future. Are, are there any other questions or, or comments? Yes. Thank you. Very interesting topic. Is there any other business to come before this committee? If there is none, uh, this committee is adjourned. Thank you.
when everyone's ready, we're going to start the committee meeting. Welcome to the meeting of the Governance Evaluation and Human Resources Committee. We will have a quorum. We have a quorum, and this meeting is called to order. Uh, good morning. At the April board meeting, the board approved expanding the Governance Evaluation and Committee to include oversight in all areas related uh, to human resources at the region's institutions. This is our first meeting of the Governance Evaluation and Human Resources Committee, which is responsible for reviewing human resources oversight, overseeing evaluation institutional of institutional heads and reviewing policy manual and code revisions. And they trusted me to run this, this <laughs> scary thought. Uh, I'd like to, at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Associate Counsel Kristen Bauer uh, who will present on FY 2024 salary policies. Good morning. Uh, what our first agenda item is the FY 24 salary policies. Um, this directs the universities to develop salary policies for faculty and staff that are not represented by unions uh, for the fiscal year beginning July 1 that best meet the needs of the institution. And what this is, is it allows then the executive director and board leadership to work with the universities to develop salary policies for those non-union. It also includes our new merit system pay plan, which starts on July 1st, um, which has 19 pay grades and a 3% adjustment to the pay grade minimums, which is what we negotiated in our last bargaining. Um, there also will be an additional merit increase of a minimum of 1%, not to exceed 2%, which um, can be chosen by each institution based on their individual needs. This is something that the board is allowed to do per the administrative code, is put an additional merit increase on if we so choose. Um, and that's all we've got for that one. Our first agenda item is approval of the FY 2024 salary policies. Are there any questions? The committee will recommend approval by general consent. Uh, agenda item number two, personnel appointments. Kristen Bauer will, rep will present on personal personnel appointments. So these are our personal appointments, which normally we'd have on our consent, but since we've got this wonderful new committee that we can go through them. They're attached in the docket, but we have 17 that are on the list. There are five from the University of Iowa, two from UNI, two from Iowa State, five from ISD, and three from IESBBI. Um, there are appointments as well as reappointments. Many of these appointments are for sec secretary and treasurer, which are required by the code that we do. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Our second agenda item is uh, approval of personnel appointments. Are there any questions or comments regarding the personnel appointments? Hearing none, the committee will recommend approval by general consent. Item number three. Kristen, uh, Kristen Bauer will present on student insurance rates. It's, it's the Kristen show today, guys, sorry. Um, per our policy, our board policy manual requires board approval for changes of um, benefits uh, for all our insurance benefits. So this is falling into, this is the University of Iowa student insurance rates. They've done a review. They actually, their upcoming, the rates for the upcoming year actually won't will remain at the current rate. Um, for January 1, there's a possibility there could be a decrease depending on 
sort of what, what the, what's looking at in the medical community. Um, there is an increase in their UI grade care program. There will be a premium increase range of 22 to $97, depending on the plan. The further details are listed in the docket. Um, but there will be no increases to the dental. So this is just the University of Iowa. Each institution kind of looks at their student rates differently. So these might just kind of come in as they get the information from each school. So that's why we just have one institution right now. Our third uh, agenda item is approval of the University of, Iowa's, University of Iowa's student insurance rates. Are there any questions or comments regarding the student insurance rates? Uh, Abby, uh, Regent um, Crow. I just had a question if you could <clears throat> explain the difference between um, why graduate students might choose um, between the SHIP and the UI grad care as different programs. That's a wonderful question that I can probably get back to you on, but I can um, I can get with with the folks that put that they do they go through an entire um, like evaluation process and all of these things and there's a committee and there's all these different layers before it even gets to us. But I can follow up and get a little extra information for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. I was just curious because I see the difference in rate prices. I figure that has something to do with benefits, and it mm -hmm. mentions that students can choose what they like. I just was wondering why they might choose one versus the other. Are there any other questions? Uh, the committee will recommend approval by general consent. Kristen Bauer will present on the pilot pro uh, on the pilot program for the ISU College of Veterinary Medicine. So this is a renewal of a one-year pilot program that we approved a year a year ago. Um, the pilot program was intended to grow and expand the veterinary clinical services offered to the state and the region while financially rewarding the faculty that's providing the doctor portion of the services. So originally this was a one-year plan. This, uh, the submission before the board right now is to extend it to a three-year plan. And it also, one of the main differences originally, uh, eligible members could only choose to do either this plan or to participate in the veterinary clinical services incentive plan that they already have in place. This change in the extension they've requested will allow them to participate in both if they qualify. Uh, so extends it three years, allows them to participate in both. That is the difference between the one-year program that we approved last year and then what's in front of you right now. Are there any questions? Our fourth agenda item is approval of the Iowa State University's changes to the College of Veterinary Medicine pilot program. Are there any further questions? The committee will recommend approval by general consent. Now, we do get to have somebody else talk. Uh, uh, now the uh, board policy manual changes. Uh, I'd like to recognize Director of Facilities John Nash, who will present on proposed policy manual changes. President Richards, members of the committee, any capital project with a budget over five million starts with the board's approval of permission to proceed with project planning and the use of our formal design professional selection process, as you know. For capital project budgets under five million, however, we would like to streamline that design process by defining in the policy manual a set of 15 standing design professional service agreements for local architectural, structural, civil, mechanical, and electrical design services, which would have terms up to five years and project budgets up to five million. Happy to take any questions you may have. Are there any questions? Our fifth agenda item is approval of the updates to the board policy manual. If there's no further questions, uh, we'll, the committee will recommend approval by general consent. Uh, is there any other business to come before the committee? If not, this meeting, the committee meeting is adjourned.
we're going to slightly adjust the the agenda uh, here, and so th we're going to work on getting it done. So don't don't leave. Well, uh, welcome to the uh, meeting of the Investment and Finance Committee, uh, and our meeting is called to order. The uh, first uh, agenda item is approval of the minutes from February 22nd. Uh, any questions or edits uh, anyone has to the minutes? Uh, hearing none, we'll consider them approved by general consent. Uh, and item number two is the Investment and Cash Management Report for the quarter ended March 31st, 2023. I'd uh, recognize uh, our uh, Marquette uh, managing partner uh, to uh, give us a, uh, a presentation. Good morning. Bear with me one second. I think it's sure. being pulled up. I can briefly talk about the market since we're, we're getting this open. But sure. I, I think one big takeaway as we sit here today is that you've got a lot more uncertainty in the market than we've seen uh, basically over the last couple of months. If you remember kind of going into the year, there was a very broad-based consensus along a lot of economists that a recession was imminent very quickly. Now the question is maybe you're starting to see some folks say this could be pushed back. Uh, Goldman today just announced they're reducing their recession odds. Uh, you're starting to see a little bit more uncertainty around what's going on in the marketplace. Uh, and because of that, you've got a lot more uncertainty with what the Fed's going to do. And that's one of the big uh, driving forces of the market right now. They're reducing the odds to by how much? Uh, so they dropped them down to 25 percent over the next 12 months. OK. So it's a, a but again, broad uncertainty around a lot of these these forecasts. Uh, if there's one thing a lot of economists can agree on, it's that oftentimes forecasts go wrong. So uh, perfect. Well, you can't be wrong predicting a 25 percent change or something, <laughs> that's right, that's because right. either way, you could say you were right. Yeah. But if you look at inflation, I think this is one of the, the key things to talk about. And inflation numbers just came out. Uh, May CPI number came in at 4 uh, percent, and that's all items. If you look at core, which strips out food and energy, that number is considerably higher. It's at 5.3 percent. And really, the big driver here, if you look at the top of these bar charts, is energy. Energy has fallen off quite a bit. Uh, which has dramatically reduced the, the all-item CPI number. One thing to remember in June, uh, June 2022 was the peak of inflation. So as you're looking at year-over-year -year comparables, anticipate next month the number that's being printed on a year-over-year -year basis will probably be even lower uh, because you have that just natural reduction based off of the higher number. Uh, but again, core CPI has held relatively steady. So the last few months you actually even saw part of it reaccelerate. 
And so that's probably the one sticky part of inflation that has the Fed a little bit concerned. If you look at the unemployment market, unemployment is still extremely robust. You still have a lot of job openings for every unemployed person out there. Uh, and again, this is one of the items that the Fed is looking at very carefully uh, because this is a continued uh, source of somewhat frustration that they can't normalize the labor market. Uh, they certainly don't want to drop this into negative territory, but they would like to get this into a more balanced equilibrium. And if you look at wage growth, this has consistently been higher over the last 12 months or so uh, relative to sort of historical averages and what you would try to target around a 2% target inflation number. So if you but, look at- But that oh, does look like a trend on wage, right? Wage but, growth wa has come wa down. Okay. Uh, absolutely. And, and one of the big drivers on the wage growth side has been leisure and hospitality as it's been harder to find workers. Uh, but you have been seeing this trend downwards. So the rate expectations the Fed meets today uh, and the, the broad consensus is that they will not raise rates today, that there'll be a pause at this meeting. And then if you look forward to the July meeting, the consensus right now is, is that there'll be a 25 basis point hike. Uh, so that's what's priced into the market right now. This, uh, again, will likely change the picture of this, especially towards the year end. Right now, the market's still pricing in a cut uh, at some point towards the end of the year. Uh, but again, a lot of this is data dependent, and we have been seeing a lot of strong data coming out of the market. One thing to point out on the U.S. equity side here is, uh, well, actually a couple of things. One, the S&P 500 has had a, a pretty strong year-to-date return so far, highly concentrated in seven stocks, uh, and they're all those tech stocks that everyone here knows. If you look at the, the seven stocks, so Amazon, Apple, um, Google, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Tesla. Those stocks, those seven stocks, have averaged over 80% return year to date. All of the other S&P 500 names, so 493 other stocks, have averaged a little over 3%. So when you look at the year to date returns, they're really being driven by a handful of companies, those mega tech companies. Uh, another interesting stat around this, you probably have heard, May, Apple's market capitalization exceeded that of the Russell 2000 index. So the entire small cap index, if you added up the market cap of all of those companies, they're equivalent to one company in the S&P 500. So these large mega cap tech companies have had a disproportionate impact on overall returns this year. If you look at the broad base, earnings guidance has been more negative than positive. Uh, so if we look forward to next quarter, you're likely to see uh, negative earnings in the next quarter, at least based on most analysts' expectations. So the market has been pretty strong, but it's been disproportionately impacted by a handful of companies that have been doing strong in a tech-led market this year. Uh, if you look at non-U.S. equity, developed markets have performed quite well this year, much stronger than emerging markets. Uh, if you look to the far right, you'll see some of the larger emerging markets like China, Brazil, India, all lagging relative to the major developed markets uh, across the country, or across the world, rather. Uh, if you look at real estate, one of the, the main things we've talked about over the last several meetings is just the uncertainty around the office market in real estate. This is looking at projected forward returns, annual returns over the next four years. And you can see just the second uh, part over their office is expected to have pretty negative appreciation over the next several years. Again, highly uncertain market, but if you look at transaction rates, if you look at uh, appraisals, there's still probably some room to, to go on the downside for office. Uh, but again, a pretty highly uncertain market right now. Uh, on the flip side, industrial and apartments are still expected to hold up fairly well over the next several years. On the private equity side, if you look at past crises, uh, whether it's a dot-com bubble or whether it's a financial crisis or any other major downturn in the markets, private equity has typically held up better uh, and rebounded quicker in, in past uh, market turndowns. Last year was no exception. Uh, if you look at the market, when the market dropped, uh, private equity actually has held up pretty well during this time period. Uh, it's not immune to downturns in certain parts of the private equity market, particularly late stage venture, uh, have been more exposed to these types of pullbacks. Uh, but broadly speaking, private equity has held up quite well, uh, which is directly related to the endowment returns uh, that you'll see in a moment. But you mentioned before that in the public markets, just a few tech companies driving returns. Should that change how we think about the private equity? Uh, do they have the same kinds of star performers and everyone else doing badly? So there, there are certainly parts of the private equity market that focus on large funds like that. However, the, in terms of the university endowments, 
Uh, mm -hmm. much more broadly dispersed, smaller companies, uh, lower levels of EBITDA, lower levels of debt, uh, just a, a much broader based exposure, uh, much less concentrated than what you're seeing in the public markets. Okay. And then lastly, just on the asset class returns, this is for the quarter, uh, just looking at returns, and you can see on the far left all of the uh, asset classes on the left are all equities. Uh, so it's been a, a nice rebound this year so far. Uh, just that second bar in is U.S. large cap. I mentioned the S&P 500. You can see up a little over 7% uh, through the first quarter. That number is now 14.7%. Uh, so just in this quarter alone, you've seen that number almost double. Uh, a very strong year-to-date return so far for, for the U.S. equity markets. Uh, conversely, on the far right, uh, still positive, but the, the income that we're generating off of fixed income has achieved a, about a 3% return for core bonds. Uh, yields have moved a little bit, and you've seen that number come down slightly this quarter, uh, but overall a much better year, both for stocks and bonds, as we sit here today. Happy to answer any questions on the market, otherwise I'll move into the, the portfolios. Any, any questions? Okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, so first up, University of Iowa operating portfolio. Again, uh, if you look at the asset allocation here, we've got roughly 60% in fixed income. Uh, lower allocation to equity uh, and more risk assets. Uh, again, looking to achieve a more stable income return here out of the operating portfolio. And again, we're in line with, with overall targets from an asset allocation side of things. Return-wise, last year was a really tough year for stocks and bonds. This year, we've seen a nice rebound. So that quarter number, again, 2.7%. Uh, and Regent Barker, I know you may point it out, but that's not an annualized number. So it was a very strong quarter overall. Uh, not quite making up for the, the returns last year, but we're certainly moving in the right direction. And then, again, long term, right where we want to be in terms of overall returns. Right. I'll emphasize that again, just how misleading that chart is, because, and I understand it's a standard yep. uh, format, but uh, yeah, those quarter returns should be up by a, you know, four times. So, yeah. We'll if, hope if, you want to yeah. if you <laughs> want to compare, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, to, to the others. Yep. Right. Uh, and again, for the Iowa State operating portfolio, similarly positioned and relative to targets right in line with, with overall policies. And again, returns very similar overall, again, with the rebound we've seen in the equity market and fixed income market, solid returns as we sit here today. Uh, and again, the second quarter is shaping up to be a pretty positive quarter as well. University of Iowa has the intermediate portfolio, and again, uh, you see a little bit more exposure to some risk assets with a higher target return here for this portfolio. Again, in line with targets from an asset allocation side of things. And then from a return perspective, you do see a little bit higher return for the quarter, uh, again, reflecting the, the little bit higher exposure to the equity markets. But again, longer term, you can see much higher uh, relative returns uh, over the, the course of the last seven, 10 years. Uh, again, exposing a little bit more on the risk side to get a higher return. And then lastly, the endowments, starting with University of Iowa endowment. Again, consistent with the last few meetings, you'll see that the one part of the portfolio that's a little higher relative to targets is private equity in the private markets portfolio. Um, and again, we expect this number to come down over time. Uh, private equity allocation tends to lag, and you've seen a denominator effect here as private equity has held up much better over the last year while public markets have, have sold off. Uh, but again, broadly in line with overall targets. And from a return perspective, one thing to keep in mind for the quarter, again, private markets are always valued on the lag, so we don't have the first quarter valuations in here yet, uh, but a 3% return for the quarter. And then, again, consistent with the higher exposure to the equity markets and private equity, you can see the, the three, five, and 10-year returns all in excess of 8%, very strong, both on an absolute and relative basis. And then the Iowa State Endowment, similarly positioned with the, the heavier allocation of private markets right now. Again, more of a denominator effect than anything. We expect that number to come down as well. And then from a return perspective, very similar returns overall. Uh, again, similarly positioned uh, portfolios, uh, just shy of 3% for the quarter. And then, again, longer term, uh, very strong absolute returns. Happy to answer any questions on any of the portfolios or returns if there are any. Any questions for anyone? All right. Great. That's all I had. Well, thank you thank very you, much. I don't think there's any other business for the committee, so uh, we are adjourned.
since we're running ahead of time, uh, we'll call the meeting to order and then uh, we will have, to have talk about the president's uh, compensation and direct, uh, director's compensation. The meeting of the Board of Regents State of Iowa for June 14th, 2023 will come to order. I'll begin by calling the roll. Regent Dunkel. Here. Regent Barker. Here. Regent Crow. Here. Regent Rouse. Here. Regent Bates. Here. Regent Lindemeyer. Here. Regent Kramer. Here. Regent Ryswick. Here. Regent Richards is present. We have a quorum and the meeting can begin. As you know, we met yesterday and uh, had a review. And at this time, a motion and second are required to approve the following personnel actions. For Executive Director Brown, establish a new deferred compensation plan commencing with July 1st, 2023 and terminating on June 30th, 2025 with annual contributions of $155,000. By the way, we'll take these all at one motion. Uh, B, for President Wilson, authorize a 50%, $50,000 in, not 50%, no, no, no. Authorize a $50,000 increase to her annual uh, base salary effective July 1st, 2023. Uh, amend the 2021 Deferred Compensation Plan to increase the total principal value by 25% and extend the termination date to June 30th, 2028. And third item in that is extend the term of our employment agreement through June 30th, 2028. For President Winterstein, Establish a new deferred compensation plan commencing on July 1st, 2023 and terminating on December 31st, 2025 with annual contributions of $415,000. And second item, establish a new employment agreement for a term commencing July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2026. For President Nook, <clears throat> authorize a $15,000 increase to his annual base salary effective July 1st, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved. Regent Rouse, is there a second? Second. Regent, a second by Regent Barker. Is there any discussion? Uh, hearing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Kramer? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Ryswick? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Okay. Now we go to this is Okay. Now we're going to move to the workforce uh, grant and incentive program. At this time, I'd like to recognize Rachel Boone, Board of Regents Chief Academic Officer will make comments. Thank you, President Richards. Um, in your docket is a lengthy list of academic programs that are aligned with workforce um, high demand occupations in the state of Iowa. Uh, this is in response to a grant and incentive program that was authorized um, by the legislature, developed by the legislature and then signed by the governor just a month or so ago. 
Um, and it is a brand new program. So we are in the, in the stages of implementation of this new program, and it is a collaborative effort to do that. This particular program is uh, students are eligible only if they're in programs that are aligned with this list of high demand occupations. The parameters about, around what counts as a high demand occupation are in the legislation, so we work with Iowa Workforce Development, who creates that list. They give us that list. We then used a federal crosswalk that helps us figure out which academic programs would typically be aligned with those occupations. There are some exceptions, so we do have some latitude to um, work outside to add in other programs that may be appropriate. I'll give you two examples just to illustrate this. Um, accountants are a high demand occupation that meet all of the benchmarks that are um, identified in this, uh, in this bill. Um, however, the, and we have accounting programs at all three of our universities. However, one of our universities, the University of Northern Iowa, uses a different code to classify their program. Their program is no different in terms of the job qualifying individuals. In fact, it's an extraordinarily strong program qualifying individuals to be accountants. So we made sure, despite the fact that it didn't match on the federal process, we were able to add it manually. Um, another example that I'll give you is from Iowa State University. Um, many of the careers on this occupation list are in the field of engineering. There are others in data security, information analysis. Those sorts of areas are all high demand occupations. Um, however, the bachelor's degree in engineering, in cybersecurity engineering, did not match based on the list we got, so we added it. So those are reflected in these lists here. We ended up ultimately with 69 unique programs from Iowa State University, 48 from the University of Iowa, and 59 from the University of Northern Iowa. The variance in that is largely around um, some of their uh, areas of sp uh, specialty and expertise. Um, agriculture and engineering have a number of programs. So Iowa State ended up with ho um, a host of programs in those areas. That gives them a slightly higher number. Northern Iowa, the way they um, classify a lot of their teacher preparation programs, uses a lot of different program codes. So that ended up really boosting the numbers there. They also have a number of uh, the programs in their technology, their Department of Technology are also ones that ma um, match in. So that's why there's a little difference in how many programs from each. However, um, it's quite an extensive list. Um, so the, the task before us is to have this board approve a uh, review and if you so choose approve the program list. Uh, the next step will be the State Workforce Board which meets next week Tuesday I believe, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, we'll also then need to approve the list and then Iowa College Aid will um, really sort of run the program and do the full implementation. They're already putting all the pieces in place with our directors of financial aid at all three institutions to be able to do this. So I will take any of your questions. I just point out it, there's a lot of STEM on this list, yes. but not entirely. Uh, we've got music education, art education, English education also. Yes, high demand across every area of uh, the teaching profession. So every program that we have that, that falls within that field uh, is included, yes. Regent Crow. Um, so just wondering with the timeline of implementation and the upcoming school year, yeah. um, would students be eligible to partake in this program as soon as this fall or would it need to be later? No, it's actually going, it will be awarded already for the fall term. Um, so the directors of financial aid are doing a lot of work on that front. Um, the good news is there will not be a separate application process from a student perspective because the parameters of the program are so clear in terms of which students will and will not be eligible. The financial, and there is a, fina um, a financial needs test associated with student eligibility, um, some of which is still being defined, by the way, by Iowa College Aid. So I can't give you this, all the specifics on student eligibility, but they, they will be very clearly spelled out. So the directors of financial aid will have those parameters and then be able to go and find all the eligible students and sort of make sure that the grant then gets assigned to their financial aid packages, if that makes sense. So it's not like a separate application students in this major would need to seek out. Um, that's it would correct. Be something that that's already correct. on their financial they, They're certainly invited to call and ask, hey, am I eligible? You know, those, that, that certainly I would encourage. Um, the only exception I will say to that, uh, Regent Crow, is the incentive piece of this, which is after they graduate, if they take a career in an aligned occupation, um, that they will need to then be proactive in reaching out to say, hey, I'm in an aligned occupation. Um, I'm eligible for the $2,000 incentive. Um, I believe Iowa College Aid will probably do some outreach 
as well. So it'll be a both and. Both Iowa College Aid Outreach and students can, or graduates can proactively reach out and request the incentive, but that process is also still in development. They have more time on that since that's at least probably a year and a half away before we have that issue. Well, if there are no other questions, that, oh, sorry. So <clears throat> with the list that you have here, will there, every year will this be looked at oh, and, and uh, redone or yeah, added? Excellent. Or? excellent question. The um, legislation requires that this uh, get, the occupation list be refreshed every two years. So every time the occupation get, list gets refreshed, we will then go through this matching process again and come back to the board for approval because there will almost certainly be some shifting around. That said, I just to be clear, the legislation also permits for if a student is in a program that then falls off the list, um, because they already had, they will they will retain it through the through their trajectory. But um, future students in that program may lose up, may not be able to get it. If that makes sense, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. What if a student changes their major mm -hmm. and it is no longer on the list? Um, this, this is an excellent question that I think I would probably have to redirect to Iowa College Aid in terms of how they will um, track and manage that. Presumably, um, because the students have to um, become eligible for this on an annual basis, so if one fall they're eligible, but then they change, the, the next fall they, they just won't be eligible. That's my educated guess. <laughs> Any other questions? A motion and second are required to ratify the academic majors and high demand jobs eligible for the Iowa Workforce Grant and Incentive Program for academic years 2023-24 and 2024-25 as described in the docket memo. Is there a motion? Uh, so moved. I'll second it. Regent Crow and Regent Dunkel seconded. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. <coughs> Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Kramer? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Ryswick? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Thank you, Rachel. I realize this is a little bit of switching around, but we're trying to take advantage of time here. Uh, we're going to switch to the board president report. Uh, uh, for today's board president report, I have a few people that I want to mention. First, I want to take a moment to recognize the board staff member who is retiring at the end of this month. She can't. Wait. Uh, Mary Brown has served as a state relations officer for the board since 2014, working speci uh, specifically on legislation issues related to UNI, the Iowa School for the Deaf, and the Iowa Educational Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Our state relations officers work directly with the board and university leadership on a variety of issues. They directly impact legislation that affects our universities and special schools, including state appropriations, including state appropriations. Mary has been a tireless and fierce advocate for the board and its institutions. Smart, passionate, and dedicated, Mary did an excellent job keeping the board members and her institutions briefed on the latest happenings at the State House. She has always working to improve bills and speak to legislators about the importance of funding for Iowa's public universities and to special and special schools. She was able to build strong relationship at all levels of state government leading to productive conversations and many successes. One such success was the language equity and acquisition 
for deaf kids or LEAD K. This bill, signed into law in 2022, allows deaf and hard of hearing students to have access to language and communication at the earliest possible age. Mary was a driving force for the bill, which will make a huge difference for these children and their families. Another success for Mary was, another success was Mary helping secure $40 million in state funding for upgrades to the Industrial Technology Center at UNI. This state-of-the-art renovation will help UNI's Department of Al Applied Engineering and Technical Management, which has majors that are in high demand. Mary always had time to offer a laugh and see the budget bright side of her situation. Her good humor, smile, and positive attitude have served her well over the years. She is a joy to be around and work with. All told, Mary served the state of Iowa for more than 30 years. I didn't realize she was that old. And has more than earned her retirement. On behalf of the board, the board office, and our institutions, I offer my congratulations to Mary on a well-deserved retirement and wish her the best. Please join me in a round of applause for a great public servant, Mary Brown. Mary, uh, Mary, could you come up here? We have a little something for you. Similar topic. Uh, as Second, as everyone knows, earlier this year, state government was realigned. As part of this reorganization, both the Iowa School for the Deaf and Iowa Educational Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired will be moving under the State Department of Education, who will, pro who will provide oversight effective July 1. Shortly, we will hear from an update from Interim President Cool on happenings at special schools. But as oversight will be shifting, this will be the last meeting where we will hear updates from ISD and IESBVI. I want to publicly acknowledge the outstanding work that the staff do for the students they serve. Whether part of the res residential program at ISD or mainstream services working through the various schools, lo various local school districts. We have hundreds of staff that provide critical services to our deaf and hard of hearing, or blind and visually impaired K through 12 students, as well as students that have transitioned to the four plus program after high school graduation. The services will not change, but as the oversight will, I want to publicly acknowledge all the staff that work at ISD or IESBVI. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have a round of applause for all these dedicated workers and everything they do for our students. And I also want to acknowledge uh, John's uh, willingness to step in as interim director. He came back from retirement uh, to go through uh, this difficult transition time. 
we will still, the regions just will still have, there will be a, this will be a process. It doesn't just happen over time because there's real estate, all sorts of things. So we may have times that we bring it up again, but we, we thank John for your service. Thank you. I have this little birdie over here. <laughs> We're breaking for lunch and we'll be back at 
Sound check, sound check, captions check.
At this time, I will uh, turn the meeting over to, we're, we're restarting the open meeting. Uh, at this time, I'll turn the meeting over to Regent Dunkel, who will run the Audit and Compliance Committee meeting. Thank you, President Richards. Our first order uh, is the minutes of the April 14th, 2023 committee meeting that you should all have in your board books. Are there any additions, corrections? Hearing none, we will approve the minutes by general consent. And now I'll turn this over and welcome uh, Deputy Auditor of State, Ernest Rubin, to present the FY 2022 State Audit Plan, along with Financial Audit Division Director, Brian Bristam. Thank you, Regent Dunkel. <coughs> uh, it's good to be here uh, with you this afternoon. To, uh, today we'll talk about the reports that we have issued. Um, and then, of course, in September we come back and we talk about our audit plan that we uh, will be developing at that time. Uh, I do have with me Brian Breskern. He's a director in our office. Uh, he does uh, have uh, quite a bit of experience on uh, the Regent Universities. He has managed the um, University of Iowa audit as well as the University of Northern Iowa. And he's kind of our expert IT person in the office, and he does our IT reviews. So I'm glad to have him here with us. Um, agenda item two lists the various uh, reports that I'll mention today. Um, I think the Regent staff have done a good job at, at getting this prepared for you, and it's a good summary of, of what we'll talk about. Uh, the fiscal year 22 reports I will briefly highlight include the statewide reports and sort of the status of those uh, right now. I'll talk about the separate reports for each university, and then finally, uh, the reports of recommendations that we have issued for the fiscal year 21 uh, engagements. So listed first are the, uh, the, what we call the State of Iowa reports, the uh, annual comprehensive financial report and the uh, single audit report. Uh, we are uh, still in the process of gathering the documents from the uh, State of Iowa, from the GAP team at DAS, and uh, waiting on a draft of the state's financial statements for us to complete our audit. Once we get that, get that documentation in the draft, we can complete that and we can issue our opinion and of course, the uh, ACFR includes the uh, universities um, in there. So the universities get their own report, and then they also are included in the, in the ACFR. Uh, so that, is not, yeah, that has not been issued. The second one listed is the single audit report also has not been issued. Uh, the way these things flow is we have, to, we have to issue the ACFR before we can do the statewide single audit. Um, the uniform guidance requires an audit of the financial statements in a conjunction with an audit of the, uh, the uh, federal programs. And so because that has not been issued, the single audit has not been issued. So we would expect that will follow shortly after the ACFR and, and that will be completed. And I will talk about a bit of a change on that here in a minute uh, as it relates to the universities. And then uh, uh, moving into then the universities, we have issued the opinions on, on the three universities. So Iowa, Iowa State, and UNI, we, we have issued those, those opinions and those reports. And those links uh, should hopefully get you to those reports. Um, Iowa State was one of, one of the last one again to be reported, but there's been progress made and I fully anticipate next year that that will be issued uh, around the same time as the other two um, in order to meet the single audit uh, requirements that I'll talk about here in just a moment. Um, on those single audit reports, normally what has been the standard practice is that the university's federal programs have been rolled into the statewide single audit report and we've issued that each year. Well, uh, because of the lateness of those, um, there's been some concerns, and I think probably rightfully so, from some federal departments about the lateness of those reports. And so we have uh, taken the step, and our staff are working uh, diligently right now to issue single audit reports for each of the universities. So that's, that's different from what's been done in the past. We expect those to be out in the month of June. And so you'll, there'll be an additional report you'll see for each of the universities on their federal programs. And we think that will hopefully uh, go a long way to satisfy the, the, the Department of Education and others who depend on those reports. Now going forward, um, we will continue to issue separate single audit reports on each of the universities. And I fully anticipate those will be issued by March 31st. Um, so the, the next fiscal year will be issued by March 31st of 24. So. We'll do that going forward until and in such time as the single audit gets completed, 
by March 31st, which is the required date that that be completed uh, according to the uniform guidance. So, uh, oh. What was yes. that, what date is that required date? I'm March sorry. March 31st. March 31st. It's nine months after the end of the fiscal year. Right. So okay. that's March 31st. Uh, moving on then is, um, I, I will say one more thing about the reports that we've issued, because I think it's important um, from, for the board's perspective. Those opinions that we gave on those financial statements were clean opinions, so unmodified opinions. We didn't have any, um, any modifications to that opinion. I don't think since I've been here we've ever had a modification to the, to the university's opinions. So that's the best you can get, so that's, that's good news. The reports and recommendations uh, follow after the, um, the internal control letters. We have issued internal control letters on each of the universities. Uh, we recently issued the one for Iowa State, and uh, that one had two findings. They were essentially repeat findings from the past year, but there has been progress made. So, um, you know, I, 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 th I think next year um, the likelihood is that there will be no findings again for Iowa State. That's my, I think, what will happen. So. Uh, the report of recommendations follow after that, um, so the ones we have issued now and you see in the agenda are for the fiscal year 21. Those roll up any findings that we've had in either the single audit or the uh, university's internal control letter, and then any other findings that we feel like should be reported. So I can tell you that in, in none of those reports are there any additional findings that have not previously been reported um, to the universities as findings. Uh, along with that was uh, we issued the board office as well as the other institutions that are considered under the regions. Again, no findings to report for any of those. Uh, to briefly touch on the IT reviews, uh, we recently completed a review of the student information system at UNI and we did not have any findings to report for that. Uh, we are planning next to begin work on the famous, uh, famous system, the facilities administration system at UNI. <coughs> Uh, we're currently finishing a review of the Maui Student Financial Aid System at the U of I, and then we are preparing to start work um, on the Workday System um, at Iowa State University. We do these, uh, these IT reviews as part of our normal procedures for um, regular financial audits. We have, to, we have to gain an understanding of those systems um, that are used uh, by the universities, and so that, we just roll that in as part of that internal control work. Uh, a couple of other items to mention, um, the universities did implement GASB 87 uh, during the last year, which was leases. Uh, something similar for, for this next fiscal year are the GASB 96 SBITAs. And what a SBITA is, it's a software-based information technology. Um, so if, if the university has a system that they have uh, purchased and are using uh, software-based, then um, they report an asset and a liability, corresponding liability, until that system is no longer used. Uh, the last thing, then, is GASB um, 94. Uh, the University of Iowa probably is the, may be the one impacted uh, as it relates to PPP. Um, so there's some reporting standards we're working through with the university to see, see if there's any impacts for reporting there. I don't anticipate there would be much, but uh, if so, we'll, we'll be sure that that gets you know, incorporated. With that, uh, I think that's my presentation. Um, I will entertain any questions that you might have, and I just want to uh, tell you again, I appreciate the, the effort of all the university staff. Uh, they're professional, and we appreciate the work that we do with them and the work that they help us with. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions besides the one that I'll have? Can you talk a little bit about your staffing? How is it now? Is that, does that have something to do with that the reports have been late and you're now yeah. trying to catch up? Staffing uh, for the past several years has been a challenge. I think not just for us, but CPA firms um, all over are having uh, struggles with, with uh, retaining and hiring staff. And we've, we've experienced the same. We are, we are still down some staff. We have, we have had some success in hiring some staff. Uh, we have had a couple of recent departures, but um, I, think, I think the staff that we have hired are, we're retaining them, and uh, you know, we, we, we're still, we still have our flyers out there looking for additional staff, but uh, it's a challenge. I think it's gonna be an on, ongoing challenge for some time. I don't, I don't know when the end of that will be, but um, so 
not, I mean, it's good news that we have been able to hire some, but not, not to the level that we really need. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Thank Great. you. Hey, Deb. Um, so, Deb, why don't you, this is Chief Audit Executive Deborah Johnston, and she's going to give us the internal audit reports that have been issued. Thank you, Regent Dunkel. I'm going to start with uh, an audit from the University of Iowa. So, in April of 2022, UI Health Ventures opened uh, Rev Revitalize U Med Spa and Salon, where they do hair and nails, and, but they also offer surgical cosmetic procedures, and I'm going to go see them. Uh, patient now is the system used for, for the electronic client record for scheduling, documenting visits, recording in, invoices and payments, etc. And preliminary observations during the beginning of our audit, we identified that it was, it was an open control environment. So we have a number of findings in this particular audit. Um, our recommendations included restricting access to physical spaces, both the external and internal doors, so that employees have access to do just what their job allows them to do. And there is a surgical side and a, the, the spa side, so we want that to stay segregated. Um, we ask that they restrict their user access in the patient now system uh, to limit access based on job responsibilities, and we want to ensure there's a proper segregation of duties between the two business lines. Um, we want them to put monitoring controls in place for products set up in the system um, and restrict the ability of staff to delete uh, invoices. They track their retail inventory in this system and, well, excuse me, on a spreadsheet, and that's in a, a Teams um, file, and that was not restricted either. So we ask that they restrict that based on those who need to have the ac actual access. ADP is used for processing their payroll. And we identified uh, employees that had multiple payroll profiles, and it was because some are paid commissions, some are hourly, but a commission person can be asked to work a, an event where they would get an hourly rate. So we recommended that they um, work with ADP to, to consolidate or group those profiles, so that's correct for tax withholding, et cetera. We recommended that they improve their invoicing processes and provide more education uh, regarding the invoice deletion and then the invoice type selection. So when you check out, is it the spa side, is it the meds, med side? Procurement approvals, they should be defined. Uh, they buy everything with credit card. This is a cash business. There's no cash or checks accepted. Um, but the, they buy their own things with a credit card. So we need to have them define and document the appropriate limits and put those in place. And then we want, to create a, want them to create a job aid um, to train staff so that they know retail items should not be included in the tip calculations. They use the tippy system. And so, and we'd also like management to look, you know, monitor the tips more closely. Okay, so that's that one. At Iowa State, we completed an audit of the Vet Diagnostic Laboratory, and our recommendations here included developing and enforcing an escalation process to ensure that their internal quality assurance group, um, act, the action plans they have, uh, the renewable trainings and the policy reviews are completed more timely. We saw some of those that were quite delayed. Um, we would like to see them perform an annual fee schedule review using a much more structured approach and then creating procedures to document that process. We'd like to see them improve their building access controls. And then also to work with the College of Med, uh, Vet Med to develop a VDL specific disaster recovery plan that's current and is regularly tested. And then they use the, they call it LIMS, it's a laboratory information management system. We'd like to see them improve the security and access uh, for people who need to use that system. So those are the two original audits that I thought I would highlight. We do have two follow-ups that are closed that, that we talked about and the controlled substances follow-up. Those are, those are closed. Are there any questions on the report? 
No. I would just note that on that med spa and salon, that just opened in the spring of 22. So yeah. you're coming in at a good time to, right. you know, get it, help them get it organized. Yeah. Yep. I'll give you a little Baker Tilly update, a little bit more information than I had the last time. So I got some information from them. Again, too late for the docket, but findings to date for them have been really immaterial. We have less than $1,000 in sales tax on a, on a material invoice, and they talked to the contractor and got that corrected right away. Um, they're saying project controls that have been implemented are operating effectively, so consequently, they are not finding material misstatements, overages, or overbillings. Um, project documentation that we provide to Baker Tilly has been accurate and complete, and that's helping them move quickly through their work. And then next steps for them include um, drafting and delivering a comprehensive audit report encompassing both the controls review that they did and then that catch-up period because we started a contract with them in January. They went all the way back to the beginning of the project. And then they're going to continue continuously monitor the project each month, reconciling those payment applications against the supporting documentation, um, and they're reviewing all the change orders. So from their perspective, things are moving along very, very well. Yeah, that's very good information for all of us. Does anyone have any questions about that? Good, good work, thank you. Will they be, do they issue you a written report? They will issue okay. a written report. I just haven't seen it yet. Okay, we'll look forward to yep. seeing that too. Um, any other business to come before this meeting? If not, I would make a motion that the Audit and Compliance Committee recommend that the board receive uh, the internal audits as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Regent Bates, for that second. The Audit and Compliance Committee is now adjourned. Okay, thanks Thank for you. coming. I, I now recognize Regent Bates, who will run the University of Iowa <coughs> Hospitals and Clinics Committee meeting. I will call the meeting to order while all the participants come up front. I think they're all here. Good afternoon. Welcome. Our first item is approval of the minutes from April 19th, 2023 meeting. Are there any questions or corrections to those minutes? If not, the minutes are approved with, uh, by general consent. I'll now welcome Dr. Brooks Jackson, Vice President for Medical Affairs and Tyrone D. Arts Dean, Carver College of Medicine. I'll turn the floor over to you now for your team's report. Okay. Thank you, and good afternoon, Regent Paints and other regents. I'm pleased to be here today, and I'm joined by Interim Senior Associate Vice President for UI Healthcare and Chief Executive Officer for University Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, Kim Hunter, to my right, UI Healthcare's Associate Vice President for Finance and Chief Financial Officer, Mark Henricks, and Dr. Matthew Howard, Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery who will deliver today's faculty presentation. So first, I'd like to start with a, a few updates. And if I could have that first slide, please. Next slide, please. So um, I am very delighted to share with you that the University of Iowa Healthcare has been named the second most trusted healthcare brand and third overall healthcare brand experience in the United States according to a recently published brand report. The organization's national recognition is the number two most trusted brand in healthcare, places it among a roster of distinguished peers. Emory Healthcare is number one, Northwestern Medicine number three, Mayo Clinic number four, and Johns Hopkins Medicine number five. So being number two among this group is quite, quite good, I think. 
Drawing on in-depth research from more than 25,000 consumers, the Humanizing Brand Experience Report by the brand experience company uh, Monago ranks more than 200 brands across 64 markets to identify the strongest healthcare experiences in the nation. UI Healthcare receives top national and regional performance on attributes such as having the best people, quality medical outcomes, buzz, meaning positive word of mouth, innovation, the latest medical treatments and technologies, freedom, supports patients in understanding options in healthcare choices, and dynamism, action-oriented healthcare. Being named the most trusted healthcare brand is an honor that reflects the strong relationship with our patients, many of whom are generations of Iowan families who have received care with us. It's a testament to our academic excellence and how our researchers, educators, providers, nurses, and care teams work together to give high quality care and experiences for our patients and their families every day. In other news, the Carver College of Medicine was proud to see 151 senior medical students graduate a couple weeks ago, including 11 graduates in the medical scientist training program. This was a terrific class, and we are so proud of their achievements. As I reported in April, we are pleased that 30% of our graduating students will remain in Iowa for their first year of postgraduate training. This includes 31 students who matched into a program at University of Iowa Healthcare uh, as well. And we're also pleased to celebrate graduates in other distinguished programs, including in our five in our Master's in Medical Education, four in our Master of Clinical Anatomy, 11 in Master of Clinical Nutrition, uh, a gra one graduate in the Medical Laboratory Science Bachelor of Science, five graduates in Nuclear Medicine Technology, and 36 graduates in Radiation Sciences Bachelor of Science uh, degrees as well. So we have many programs besides just the medical school MD degree. We trust you share our tremendous pride and enthusiasm for the success of these outstanding students, and we wish them all the very best as they begin their careers in medicine and science. In terms of research funding, overall research funding in the Carver College of Medicine in, through May of this year, so 11 of the first 12 months, continues to look strong, up more than 8% over this time last year. Specifically, NIH awards, which are extremely competitive, are up by about 8.8% uh, from this time last year, while our non-NIH awards are holding steady at an increase of about 7% over the same time last year. So that's very good news. The number of overall new and competitive renewal proposal applications is up 1.4% uh, compared to this time, and NIH continues to trend upward in terms of applications with 7.3% over this time last year. So you know, you got to apply for grants to get them, so applications are important. Uh, so this is very positive and ahead of the 2.5% we saw last April. And finally, as this will be my last meeting as Vice President for Medical Affairs and Dean, I want to express my sincere appreciation to the Board of Regents for its support over the past few years. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve in this role, and I am so grateful for the opportunity to lead such an amazing group of talented, hardworking, mission-focused, dedicated, and compassionate individuals who, to who together comprise the heart and soul of UI Healthcare. Since 2017, when I started, UIHC has been able to significantly increase patient access, patient quality metrics, research funding, philanthropy, the percentage of faculty publishing, medical student uh, U.S. licensing exam scores, healthcare parity initiatives, and money for capital needed to build a new patient tower, a North Liberty Hospital, and badly needed renovations in current research and patient care facilities. Our success in addressing the COVID epidemic with the mortality rate in Johnson County that was one-third the rest, rest of the state is remarkable and speaks to the talent and hard work of our faculty, staff, trainees uh, as well. Our collective success was made possible by each one of their many contributions, and I sincerely thank them for all they have done to advance our great institution. Looking ahead, President Wilson and Provost Kriegel have made an excellent choice in selecting uh, Dr. Denise Jameson is my successor, and I think uh, excellent choice, and UI Healthcare will be in very good hands indeed. And I look forward to following with interest what I know will be a very bright future for the state's premier academic medical center. So thank you again for the opportunity to serve UI Healthcare, the University of Iowa, 
the Board of Regents, and the people of Iowa. So I wish you all the very best. And with that, I'll now ask Kim and Mark to provide the financial and operational update. Great, thank you. We like to bring information to you about how we support the citizens of the state, right? That's one of our important missions. Wanted to talk with you today about our burn center and the way we treat burn patients. Um, probably everybody in here has had a burn of some sort, right? But hopefully a most minor one. So I think it's important to highlight the um, tremendous burn center that we have and, and all of the work that goes into that by a whole big team of people. We are the only certified burn center in the whole state of Iowa, uh, first of all. We opened our center in 1996. In the burn center, we have 17 inpatient beds for patients. We provide intensive level care, but other uh, less intensive care. It's really based on what a patient needs. In that center, it's unique also in that we provide not only care for inpatients in the hospital, but we have a segment of that facility that provides ambulatory or outpatient care because burn patients need continued care after they leave the hospital. We, we also are kind of unique. There are only 34 burn centers in the whole country who serve both adult and pediatric patients, and we're one of them. So we can take care of anyone uh, really who needs us. We receive patients uh, from a lot of states around us. On this particular map, you see where we're located by the star, and the dark circles represent burn centers throughout the country. And you can see that there are a number of states that do not have a burn center. So um, we're very proud of the, the mission that we serve here. Our closest burn center uh, to us is in Madison, Wisconsin, which is about 150 miles away. So I wanted to talk with you about a little bit about uh, the age of our patients that we serve and the common causes of burn. Uh, when you look at the uh, box or the table on the right, it really just shows you 30% of the patients we serve in the burn center are pediatric patients, so children less than 18 years of age. And then the uh, bar you'll see breaks that part down, and it, it shows you that 14% of the patients we serve in pediatrics are between zero and two years of age, which is just kind of hard to believe of a a little one um, needing to come receive care, uh, but, but they do, and we're happy to take care of them. And luckily, we have all of our experts with the Children's Hospital to help with that as well. And then, interestingly enough, about 70% of the patients we serve in the burn center are, are less than 50 years of age. If you think about it, though, the ways you get burned, people that are less than 50 tend to be more active and more involved in activities that may result in burns. So we're going to go through this just a little bit. Um, the na Nationally, and then our data here at UHC says that about 93% of all burns are what are classified as thermal burns, right? So whether you get burned by a flame or a fire, or you're scalded by hot liquid or grease, or you um, are burned by flammable um, materials, or you accidentally touch a hot object, right? Those are all classified as thermal burns. Um, with uh, thermal burns, though, because flames are involved in some of them, some of the patients that have thermal burns also have inhalation injuries where they've inhaled um, a lot of uh, smoke and uh, um, high air, air at high temperature, right? And so when we look at um, scalding burns, um, a lot of children we know are burned by scalding burns, right, hot bath water and whatnot. Um, and then um, the next category of burns is chemical burns. So um, you exposure to different chemicals, including some used in um, farming, um, can cause chemical burns. And then electrical burns is the last category. Maybe this is a little bit of a public service announcement, right? But when you look at burn centers, right, and the type of things that happen that bring patients into burn centers, you know, we see a rise in the number of patients coming to the burn center in the spring because that's when people are doing cleanup. 
uh, burning things in their yards and their farms and um, all to clean things up from the winter. And their clothing may catch on fire. Um, and so we also see in the spring with increased levels of farming activity, different chemicals where people are burned. And right now, so we sit here at the middle of June and we have July 4th coming up soon. And we all know that um, across the country with fire, fireworks and celebrations, we do tend to see more burns. So we should all be careful. Not to mention it's a really dry year so far. Severity of burns, I want to talk with you just a little bit about that. There are really two things that um, help us determine the severity of burn. One is um, the amount of the body that's involved in the burn. And over on the right-hand side of the slide, you see an adult figure and a pediatric figure. And it really just breaks down for you the percent of your body that would be um, involved in the burn based on whether it's your trunk or your arms or your legs or your head. And um, and the percentages vary just a little bit with children just because they have smaller body surface area. Another um, issue that we look at is the um, depth and the degree of the burn. So not to get too much detail, but the what looks like came out of a medical textbook, there is a cross-section of anyone's skin, right? There are multiple layers to our skin. We don't hopefully see them all. You normally just see the top layer of your skin. Uh, but depending on how deep the burn goes um, has uh, bearing on how severe the burn is and how intensive the treatment may be for the patient who is burned. All of this is taken into account when we determine what type of treatment is needed um, and the urgency of which to treat a burn. So let me talk for just a minute about how a burn patient could present to us. So naturally, a burn patient could arrive in our emergency department, right? They could drive to us. But quite often, because we receive patients from many counties across the state and other states, these patients are transferred to us by um, emergency services. And so a patient may typically have a burn. They call for their uh, emergency services who responds to them and then really assesses them. Once it's determined that, goodness, we have a burn we're not going to be able to treat locally, we need to transfer the patient to UIHC, then the local emergency folks talk with our admission and transfer center and let them know that information. And then we have our burn center um, staff who get really involved at that point with um, burn center nurse talking with that local emergency um, personnel and talking about the extent of the burn and what treatment has been started. And then um, once they determine the extent of the burn, if it's 20% um, or more of the, the person's body area, then we go ahead and activate uh, knowing that we're gonna have a severely burned patient coming in and we go ahead and get ready for them. And so all along the way, there's a lot of communication um, between us and uh, the, the folks in the emergency services taking care of that patient. And then when they arrive at UHC, um, after all that's taken place, they just bypass the emergency department and go straight to the burn center because that's where our experts are. There are different things we do when we treat a patient who is burned. So one of the things that's really important about our skin is it helps keep infection out and it helps keep moisture in, right? And so one of the things we have to do when a patient's been burned and is losing a lot of fluid through that burn area, we have to give them additional fluids. And, um, and that's one of the, the things that we do and keep that in balance. Another thing is if a burn patient's burn really is not going to heal within a few weeks, then we have to consider doing skin grafts so that we put skin grafted over that area and help it heal. And so this is a partnership with our pathology colleagues. Uh, we will purchase skin grafts uh, or skin for grafting, or sometimes a patient has skin in another area of their body that can be grafted um, to their area of burn. And then hydrotherapy is um, an important part of treatment for all burn patients because you've got to keep the skin clean and you want to keep it free of infection. And so uh, patients really, it's sort of like a shower or a bath that's done very routinely for a patient to really uh, keep their skin in the best condition possible where, where it's been burned. It's quite a painful procedure, as you might imagine. And so we really work in close partnership with our anesthesia colleagues for pain management during those particular procedures. 
Another thing you might not think about is the environment needs to be extra, extra clean, right? Because a person's skin has been disrupted. And so uh, controlling for dust and other environmental factors is really important. The temperature control is another thing you may not think about, uh, but we need to keep the rooms quite warm for those patients as they lose heat through their skin more with the burn than without. Hi there, um, my oh. name is Jill Lynn Schneider Here's, and I'm the nurse manager at the University of Iowa Burn here Trauma Center. Is a video and today about we're in our, our hydrotherapy center. suite, which is where we do all of our patients bathing and dressing changes for those that have burn and wound injuries. Um, typically our staff would dress like this um, and very, it's protective for them and the patient. The gown is waterproof, they have a shield to protect their eyes, a mask as well. Um, the bonnet is to keep their hair out of the way. And then because it's very hot back here to keep the patients warm, they would, can wear these ice packs that can, they can wear it around their neck and as a vest. So they, they, they try to stay comfortable during the bath as well. So on a typical day for a patient in our unit, we would bring them back either via cart or ambulate them to our tub room. They would be assisted to the cart. If they walked, they would just sit down. We'd help them lay down. If they were on the cart, we would slide them over. Typically it is two staff members that do the hydrotherapy. Um, the patients are properly pre-medded with narcotics and things like Tylenol prior to the bath. During the bath, we remove all their old dressings. We assess their wounds. Um, we have the pri uh, providers or the advanced practice providers come back and take a look at the wounds. Sometimes we'll take photographs of pressure areas and things on admission so we can track that during their hospital stay. And then we also take pressure um, pictures of their wounds during different phases of their healing process so we can see how their wounds are healing, how our graft take is after surgery. We also look for things such as infection during the hydrotherapy, spreading redness. We know um, if there's any odor on their dressing or any um, drainage that doesn't look normal. We give them medications that will ease their pain and then also that can help them forget the bath. And our goal is that they have very little memory of this procedure. So that just gives you a glimpse, probably no one in here is, hardly has been in a burn unit before, but that's what it looks like. Um, so we talked a lot about, about a patient burn and how they arrive to us and some of the care we provide, but they don't stay with us forever, right? And so the goal is they go home. But we do provide for them, care for them long term. So the chart on the left shows our, the average length of stay of patients. So majority of our patients stay 14 days or less with us, um, and which is, great that they don't have to stay much longer. The middle uh, chart really just shows the number of follow-up visits patients typically have after they leave our inpatient care. And so you can see that some may have, you know, up to 10 visits for, um, you know, follow-up care with them. And then we have partnerships uh, with a variety of services that we offer in those in com the community to help support patients long-term. We do um, take care of patients from across the state as well as other states. So in 2020, the whole calendar year 2022, we um, in the Burn Center served patients from 78 counties across Iowa. And then we took care of 81 patients from other states. So we have a significant reach there. Our burn unit, like I said, was built in 1996. And so it's time for us to uh, modernize and improve the unit. And um, we, um, along with you know, permission to plan, are working on doing this. Um, with the remodeliz remodelization of this unit, we're looking at renovating the hydrotherapy suites that you just saw the video about. We're planning to add to those 17 rooms by four, so we'll have a total of 21 inpatient rooms, which will be great, and then add some other support space for uh, families. The other thing I mentioned is that we see ambulatory or, or outpatients in the same space, and this project will allow us to further separate those areas. They'll still be contiguous, but provides for some good separation, uh, which will be important. We reach into the community um, and are involved in many activities, whether it's camps, burn camps for children, um, support groups, um, work a lot with uh, EMS, fire department, and other things to really educate people of all ages on burns and uh, support them as well in their recovery. And then, of course, people are key to all of this, and we believe we have a great team, um, and they've won many awards, as you can see. 
And then you know, always think back to why do we do what we do, right? Why are we proud that we work in this field, right, of, of health care? And this is a great story. So it's all about the people and the impact we have on the people of our state and beyond. And so I wanted to just show this picture to you, which tells a whole lot. So in this uh, particular uh, picture, this patient, and we have his permission to tell his story. He's right, quite proud of where he is now. Uh, his name is Jim, and he is from Butler County, Iowa, and was pursuing a career um, with, as a lineman, you know, working on electrical lines with a line injury and uh, or energy and he actually was involved in a brush fire and cleaning um, some things up at home and he had mostly very severe burns third degree burns and had a very low chance of survival he stayed with us nine and a half months um, from late 2020 to the middle of 2021 and he was one of our patients that stayed the longest time of any that we've had but really thanks to him his family and all of our burn center staff and other supporting folks at UHC, he was able to make a great recovery. So um, he's had over 40 surgeries, um, different ways we've helped him make sure that he could breathe appropriately, maintain his body temperature, and avoid infection. And so the good part of the story is he did go home. He went to a rehab facility um, after he left our care, and now he is at home. Uh, the picture on the left shows him with his girlfriend, Mickey, before the accident ever happened, and she stood by his side along with other family members, and uh, more recently, they actually are married now and still together. So, you know, it makes me proud to see what we do. This is just one example of many of how we impact people's lives in a very positive way. And for those whose outcome is not as good, which that happens too, we um, you know, provide great support for people as they go through um, whatever the situation is. So Fred, that's a clinical story there. Okay. Do we have any questions before Regent Linda Kim, you mentioned that you sometimes purchase skin grafts. Or is that harvested skin or is it lab produced skin? And what's, what's a patch of skin go for nowadays? Whoa. <laughs> I'm sure it's a lot because prices of everything have yeah. gone up. I'm not certain on the pricing, to yeah. be honest with you. A lot of the skin we use is harvested. If it's not harvested from the patient, um, is harvested from cadavers. And I don't know the answer to your question about are they any grown in labs that are used. I don't know that. I just had a neighbor that underwent a skin graft, and she really? she used uh, I think it was lab produced. Okay. Are there any other questions for Kim? Just a very good example of the good care that UIHC provides. Great. Yeah, we're we're real proud, and it's fun to see. Um, you know, this particular patient stayed with us so long, and there was a huge celebration. I got to see it the day that he left. Um, one interesting thing, anytime um, I've been on the bird unit, um, the nursing staff and the physician staff, if they're not, if we have a patient that's leaving or we have a staff member who's being recognized for something, they come in from home because they are that much of a team and a family um, and become family with the families and patients who are on the unit. So um, it's really heartwarming, quite honestly. Yeah, good family. <laughs> Very good. So I have one slide here just Oh, sure. Go ahead. I'm just, sorry. Just to show you about medical training expansion, just we provide a periodic update on this. And so really this slide just contains all the information. So we are expanding um, our training programs in, in just a few ways. One or, um, or there are two new fellowships. One is in clinical informatics and the other is in um, genetics, uh, laboratory genetics and genomics. Um, there is so much going on with clinical informatics and the need to utilize data from it, um, data analytics, predictive modeling, all types of things, how to use the electronic me medical record more efficiently. And so uh, this fellowship in clinical informatics is related to those things. And then uh, the laboratory uh, genetics and genomics um, is in our pediatric area. And then um, for pediatric radiology, you can see an experience uh, expansion of one slide um, and then urology we're just shifting 
that around. So where the current program is six years, uh, we're just shifting it to five years and shifting the learners around there. And then the Sioux City Family Medicine Residency Program, you know, um, is becoming us. And uh, so we've added to that. So the net new learners here um, in this slide are seven. And so again, we know that we have a, a, an important mission to serve um, the educational needs of the learners and provide more uh, physicians um, and other providers uh, for the state. And so this is just part of that. Very good, thank you. So today I'll provide a financial update through the month of April, uh, year to date. And as we go through this, um, the volumes and financial trajectory haven't really changed much from the last time we met, but we do have updated Moody's numbers, which we'll look at those benchmarks. Um, overall, looking at volumes, inpatient volumes are under budget. Under budget. We've talked about, as we've come out of last year, we had a lot of medical um, high length of stay outlier cases. We're getting to a more normalized mix of med surge, and we're kind of seeing that as we're seeing reduced dis uh, days, but not discharges. Uh, surgeries, we are closing the gap uh, versus budget. Uh, just a reminder, coming into this year, because of uh, staffing challenges, we had four uh, ORs closed. We opened two of those in the first half of the year, and the other two have been open here in the second half of the year. Um, and then lastly, clinic visits. Uh, clinic visits, we've um, had initiatives around clinic visits and access um, since November, and we've made quite a bit of progress and April was the first month that we met budget, so we're seeing positive trends there as well. On the expense side, um, inflationary uh, pressure still persists. Um, so we're seeing salary expenses year to date are below budget, but really that's because of the first half of the year um, we ran under budget, but each month after that in the second half of the year we've, we've been above budget. Agency levels still remain uh, elevated overall. Um, Non-salary expenses up about 1.6% above budget. In total, the inflationary impact, if we look at year over year, our expenses are up 9.2% overall. Uh, from a margin perspective, overall through April, around 13%, uh, that includes the dedicated dollars to facility expansion and access with the Medicaid directed payment. Uh, without those, we're about 1.5% uh, versus a goal of uh, about break even uh, through April. Uh, briefly on the financials, uh, if you look at the, the gray line, basically that's where we're at with overall operating margin 1.5%, uh, which is about $30 million. Um, and then with, with uh, the director paying about $300 million. The net operating revenue you can see is about 1.1% above budget. Um, really that's, that's an impact of seeing kind of a normalized mix. That's part of the reason why we're above budget there. Operating expenses overall at budget. Um, so as I mentioned, the metrics, the key metrics, uh, there's three key metrics we uh, share with this group regularly, and those have been updated through April, in, in April, um, but they're always um, kind of delayed. So these are through basically June 2022 closes. Uh, but if we look at operating margin, you know, what we've talked about before that Moody's median was 4.0%. Um, so you can see, um, not surprising in the industry, that, that margin, that benchmark has gone down to 1.5%. Um, we're at about 0.5 without direct to payments or 12% uh, percent with direct to payments. Uh, days cash was quite elevated before it was at 340 days. Um, you can see that's come down to 260. Some of that's due to market conditions and um, what we've seen in the investment market uh, nationally, so that's impacting as we roll those numbers forward. So we're getting kind of closer to the overall median, you know, continually run in the mid 200s as far as our day's cash. Um, and then lastly, uh, debt to cap. Debt to cap was running about 19.6%. You see it's actually gone up nationally. Uh, so now we're at a point where our leverage percentage is lower um, than the overall metrics or the median. So um, in all three cases, um, we're looking pretty good against the overall updated medians um, that we've seen and with the April, April updates. Sometimes they'll do a mid-year update, so we'll see if they'll do another update, but this is their major update of the, the medians. Um, and then one other item uh, this month is the uh, proposal around the charge master price increase. Um, so we're proposing a 6% price increase. This is consistent with what we've done over the past five years plus. Um, given market um, conditions, we expect many facilities um, to be well above a 6% rate increase. So we feel that it's a conservative amount. 
Um, overall, we continue to be under the 50th percentile of AMCs as far as from a pricing level. And, and lastly, just mention that, you know, from a charity care program perspective, uh, we have a ch uh, pretty aggressive charity care program that shields the medically indigent uh, from the impacts of a, a price increase overall. Um, so that's the financial update, and then wanted to present to the board the proposal on the charge master increase. Yep. Okay, go ahead with the presentation. Uh, next, we have uh, Matt Howard, MD. He's a professor and chair of the Department of Neurological Surgery at the University of Iowa and a position he's held since 2001. Uh, I think he's one of the longest serving chairs at the University of Iowa Healthcare. He received his undergraduate degree at Tufts uh, University and is a medical student at the University of Virginia. He collaborated with neurosurgery resident Dr. Sean Grady and Professor of Physics Rogers Britter to invent the magnetic surgery system, there whereby flexible implants within the body are guided by externally generated magnetic fields. And that system is now used to perform robotic cardiac ablation procedures in patients throughout the world. He received his neurosurgery residency training at the University of Washington and Atkinson Morley's Hospital in London, England. And during his uh, residency, he was awarded an NIH Individual National Research Award to pursue two years of postdoctoral fellowship training in cortical electrophysiology research. In 1993, he joined the faculty at the University of Iowa, so it's been 30 years, and established the Human Brain Research Laboratory with collaborating neuroscience colleagues throughout the U.S. and overseas. Dr. Howard has received continuous NIH funding as a principal investigator since 1995, and uh, his research findings are regularly published in leading scientific journals, including Nature, Nature Bi Neuroscience, and Nature Communications. 2014, Dr. Howard was selected by the Society of Neurological Surgery as the recipient, recipient of the Win Prize, which is the specialty's highest award for career achievement in neuroscience research. He is an experienced medical device inventor with over 30 issued U.S. patents, and he has co-founded four university spin-off medical device companies as well. Dr. Howard was elected a fellow of the U.S. National Academy of Inventors in 2019, and we are delighted that he joins us today to discuss some of the exciting work being done to bring innovative ideas to life in the development of new medical devices. And I should also add, he is one of our most active and productive neurosurgeons uh, in, the, in the hospital as well, and is uh, constantly there and performing surgeries 24-7. <laughs> <So>. Thanks, Dr. <laughs> Jackson. And, um, Thank you for all your service as uh, Dean V. Pame. Did a great job and really appreciate it. Um, thanks for letting me come here and talk about medical device inventions. And it's tied to this uh, really special program called Proto Studios, which is a collaborative effort that uh, impacts people throughout the state of Iowa. And it is, uh, as I understand it, it's a combination of the state of Iowa, Iowa City, and the University of Iowa, where they've brought together a special group of people and uh, technologies that allow us to do prototyping. And I'm going to talk about why prototyping is so important. So this is part of John Darcy's um, innovation, uh, commercialization, economic development um, initiative. And it's working great. So actually, John Darcy is a very experienced uh, med tech entrepreneur, and, and that's, uh, that's very helpful when you're trying to do these things. All right, let me. So as was mentioned, I got involved with this uh, field of developing medical devices when I was a medical student. And most of these, uh, essentially all these ideas come from people who are trying to solve a problem. And it's particularly um, it, it's a great setup for younger folks who are coming into a field. They see things and they go, you know, why do we have to do it that way? Isn't there a better way to do this? And when I was a student, I was lucky enough to team up with a world-class physicist and a neurosurgery resident and say, why don't we use magnets to um, guide catheters through the body? So that's the idea phase. Um, 
and that's important, but it is uh, far from sufficient. <laughs> a lot of good ideas. Um, this one actually worked out because uh, a lot of things lined up, but but uh, it doesn't always go this way. And I want to talk about what, what it takes for things to line up, so to speak. So that device is now used um, in centers uh, throughout the world. Many fortunate things happened, and part of it was uh, related to geography. So the project started when I was a student at UVA, but then I did my residency on the West Coast so that I could team up with, back then you had to be geographically in decent proximity to the venture capitalists and the engineers who are gonna help, um, and med tech experts who are gonna help you develop these things. So we, we did this startup company, and Goldman Sachs brought us public about seven or eight years ago. Um, a lot learned. So here are the key things. Uh, you need uh, time, money, and uh, talent, particularly for the, and I know members of the board have a lot of experience with this, this kind of thing, maybe in something other than med tech. You, um, Time is so critical because typically your funding comes in a funding event that's driven by milestones. So they'll say, okay, well, what do you propose you're gonna get done? And we'll give you this much money. We don't get, we're not gonna give you more, we're gonna give you this much, and you have to get it done in a certain period of time. And if you fail, your company can fail, and, and, and that's that. And none of this works unless you have talented people. And you have to have experienced med tech people. The venture capitalists are not going to give money to make something, try to make a company go if there isn't somebody who has some experience who's, who's uh, driving the ship. So I like this um, concept by Colonel uh, Boyd that called the Boyd Loop. So he developed this uh, back in the 50s um, with the Air Force, and the, the point was to try to be more effective in air-to-air -air combat, but now it's used pretty widely, as I understand, different uh, business uh, pursuits, and it sure fits with what we have to do when we're developing uh, medical devices. So there, here are the parts that you have to do in a cyclical fashion. You observe, observe quickly, figure out what's going on, you orient yourself, you make a decision, you act, and then you have to do it iteratively. And if you can do it faster than your competitor, you're gonna win. If you do it slower than your competitor, you run the risk of running out of money and uh, failing. So that's where this Proto Studios thing comes in, it is prototyping. Um, and that in turn is, is linked to this, I guess not so new right now, but, but just exploding technology, and it's of, often retur referred to as the third industrial revolution, uh, 3D printing. So before 3D printing was available, we used to have to, we had a great machine shop here, actually, and you'd go to them with these pencil drawings, and they would uh, they'd say, okay, well, we'll try to do, we can't make it happen the way you've written it because what you are proposing is too small and too intricate, but we'll make you something bigger uh, so that you can work out the mechanics and see if you're on track or not, or whether, whether you have to uh, adjust your plan. And here's, here's a, um, in 3D printing, makes it possible to create exquisitely small, complicated uh, devices very, very quickly at comparatively quite low costs. So here, here's a comparison. Uh, one of our projects involves trying to develop a stimulator that will deliver electrical currents to the uh, spinal cord. And um, it's very innovative, really difficult. Uh, we've gone through dozens of, of design iterations because you have to get through this membrane surrounding the spinal cord, you can't have leaks, you have all these performance criteria have to be met. And we started the project before 3D printing was available, and that's on the left side there is a picture of a device that our machine shop made for us. It took them three months, it's a beautifully designed, th it's, it's 100 times too big, but it allowed us to test a kind of a, a concept we had for these flanges to, to push it down on the dura and get this seal. They worked hard on that, cost a lot of money. They give it to me and my team, and we messed around with it for 20 minutes, and we go, okay, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> you know, this, this, no, and this is why it doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. Let's do it again. 
Now, if you're looking at another three months and all sorts of money, that, that's a big problem. About that time, uh, Chuck Romans with, with Proto Studios uh, came on board and boom, it just took off. You, you would, his art sketches, he would turn into serious design documents on the computer, he'd print them out, and now they have a place right in the hospital so that in between operations or between clinic patients, he can come over I'll test it, and the other, the other surgeons will test and will say, you know, that thing isn't quite right. Uh, can you do this? Can you do that? And that void loop cycle time ends up being a few days instead of a few months. So it's, it's absolutely an uh, incredible game changer. So that applies to the actual work of, of getting the design just right. But the other thing that this has done, and I, I think Iowa is impacted more than other places, as I mentioned, when you're on the West Coast or when you're in Boston, where I was, you, you, you've got access to, to the key resources right there in close geometric, uh, geographic proximity. We don't have that uh, here, and there are talented people all over the world that you want to work with. So with Zoom, of course, you can see people, you can work on sketches together with these um, internet data transfer things. We can send huge amounts of data really efficiently that we couldn't uh, do before, but equally important, we can share these designs, these digital designs, and then we can print something here, and our collaborator can print so something somewhere air. We, we can go back and forth, and a good example of this is a project that is uh, going pretty well, and and that's uh, this is what we're calling the Iowa cranial plate, and this he here's the need um, when you have severe brain swelling from a head injury or a stroke. There's an operation we do called a hemicraniectomy. You take off a big portion of the skull, you close the scalp over it, the brain swells, and if the patient survives, later on you do a second operation. You bring them back to surgery, you reopen the incision, you put an implant in. That second operation, very costly, high complication rate. So we said, that's a problem. Let's see if we can figure out a way to put an implant in in the beginning that accommodates this brain swelling, but then without a second operation would come back down into a nice contoured, secure skull reconstruction, just like the cranioplasty operation. So this, uh, we started a number of years ago. The design phase, it's all out of Iowa. So you've got these surgeons who, who understand the problem, and uh, Chuck Romans was helping us with this. We've got that idea right there. We printed some simple prototypes out of like plastic materials, and then I reached out for commercial partners, because I knew there were a few entities in the world that would be ideal for teaming up with this exact kind of technology. And the best partner is called KLS Martin. Um, they're a German-based company, been, family business, been around for 150 years, but now they have a pretty strong US presence. That's a picture on the right of us doing an experiment. They printed the device in the middle. And they have manufacturing capabilities and, and a detailed understanding of, of what's going to fly for, through the FDA that, that's just very rare and, and valuable. So um, this is a paper we just published, came out last month, and it shows that it's a highly effective collaboration. We've got the right people, the money is, is actually coming in from KLS Martin, it becomes kind of a... Um, new product development project for them, but we set up a very creative intellectual property arrangement where no matter how this project goes, you know, if it looks a little different than this, uh, one part's a little, the University of Iowa has locked in a royalty arrangement that you can't wiggle out of. You know, over the years, been involved with these medical device things for over 30 years, turns out the companies don't want to pay royalties. You know, so they'll, they'll work on ways to try to, get around that. And this, we locked in the beginning, so we're not going to be greedy, but we want it so that you don't worry about who came up with the idea. You get together as a team and you make it happen. And actually, the, the, the um, Kalis Martin people were just in town yesterday, and they, they, they emailed me a minute ago. They got back, the ones from Jacksonville got back. So this is, this is a great project. This opens up, um, this allows people who decide to pursue their medical career here at the University of Iowa to be in the med tech game. You can do it now, whereas before it was, it was just too difficult because of the geography. 
But it's kind of like, you know, the writer's workshop, what do you need? You need creative people, maybe paper or pencil. Um, we need more than that, but now we've got it. So uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited. This technology is helping um, us here at the university massively. So thanks a lot for your attention. Very good. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Howard? Comments? So I, oh, I thought, so I want to know, during all these prototypes, do you, are you going to need to clone yourself a couple times for how busy you are? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all about the team. I mean, we got, we it got is. great, it is. great team. And you know, and the fun thing is um, our residents, so neurosurgery residency is seven years long. So we get great residents, and they have two years of research training embedded in the middle. They all are in on these meetings, and they contribute really good ideas. It's these young people who were looking at it and they say, you know, why do we do that? And I go, I don't know. But he says, well, let's do it differently. And, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank Very you. Good. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead with the vote. Uh, CFO Mark Henricks addressed UIHC agenda item three, the proposed UIHC rate increase for FY 2024. Are there any questions about his presentation before we go on? I need a motion and a second are required to approve the UHC proposed rate increase for FY 2024. Is there a motion? I make the motion. Regent Dunkel moved in a second. Second. Regent Rouse. Is there any further discussion before I take the vote? Okay. Regent Richards? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Kramer? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Ricewick? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Bates votes yes, and motion is approved. So. Thank you for your report. Congratulations for being number two on an awesome list. And most of all, thank you, Dr. Jackson, for everything that you've done for UIHC, for working with us. It's been a pleasure, and we just wish you the very best. Okay. Thank you. Take a three minute pause.
uh, now we'll, uh, we're going to continue to modify our schedule a little bit here. Uh, first item will be the consent agenda. Are there items that board members would like to remove from the consent agenda for a separate vote? Um, President Rich, I, I don't want to remove it for a second vote. I just had a comment on one item, the, uh, the sustainability report. Um, interesting report. In the future, I wonder if it'd be possible to see more on return on investment of those projects, you know, what they cost and what they return financially if they're providing us with utility savings or anything like that. Okay. Okay, good, good point. <clears throat> Any other comments? A motion and a second are required to approve and receive the items on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I'll make the motion. Regent Dunkel. Second. Regent Ricewick seconded. Any discussion? Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Kramer? Yes. Regent Ricewick? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, President uh, Wilson, who will uh, introduce a speaker. Thank you, President Richards. We're excited to introduce to you today Dr. Aaron Bowes, who has been very flexible today and has jumped on in, in his vehicle to get over here, uh, given our change in schedule. Um, Dr. Bowes is a native Iowan from Emmitsburg. So I said to Regent Rouse, you should be really excited about what we're going to hear uh, before you. He completed his undergraduate MD and PhD degrees at Iowa. So he is a triple alum, I guess, um, before doing his residencies in pediatrics at UC San Diego and in pediatric neurology at Harvard Medical School. He also completed a fellowship in neuropsychiatry and non-invasive brain stimulation at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. In 2016, we were lucky for him to come back and join the faculty here at Iowa. He now is serving as the Roy J. Carver Associate Professor of Neuroscience with appointments in the Departments of Pediatrics, Neurology, and Psychiatry in the Carver College of Medicine. He's also the Director of the Pediatric Neurology Division. He is also the Director, finally, of the UI Center for Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation, and that's the work you're going to hear about today. So uh, welcome to Aaron. Thanks. Oh, no problem. I'm all set. Well, I'm excited to talk to you guys today. So I'll talk about the Center for Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation, which is something that we started just uh, in 2019 was the application. So I can give you an update after a few years. And as Barbara Wilson mentioned, I got here in 2016. Um, so I have a brief presentation, uh, plenty of time for questions if you guys have any. Interrupt along the way or I'll have some time at the end as well but I'll tell you about what, what is TMS, uh, and then sort of touch on some of the highlights from our main three missions, which is in the clinical realm, research, as well as education. So first, I just wanna mention brain stimulation as a treatment. So I think we're all very familiar with using medications for brain disorders. We're, um, we're the beneficiaries of you know, a, a lot of great medications that have come out over the last 50 years to treat all kinds of different brain disorders, whether it's epilepsy or schizophrenia or Parkinson's or depression. Uh, we have medications for pretty much all of these, which is great, but they don't always go as far as we'd like them to go. So there are often about a third of people who don't respond well to medications. Um, and even those who do respond, they don't often have a complete response where they're left with some impairments in quality of life, some residual disability. 
So we're looking to en enhance what we can do in neurology and psychiatry, and brain stimulation is one relatively unexplored area. So just briefly, by way of background, uh, brain stimulation has been around for a long time. Uh, the first method that was developed was ECT, or electroconvulsive therapy, and that dates back to the late 1930s. Uh, actually, a lot of the pioneering work was done here at the University of Iowa. It's still in use today, but it's used sparingly, so it's really just in the most severe instances of depression or psychosis. And then in the 1990s, uh, deep brain stimulation came to fruition, uh, which is still very much used today primarily for treating uh, patients with Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. And that involves a neurosurgical procedure to drop an electrode into the brain and, uh, and you wear the stimulating device implanted in your chest. So that's something that stays with you after the surgery. Also very effective. And then the new kid on the block here is TMS, which is what I'll talk about today. So transcranial magnetic stimulation. And what that is is basically you have a coil that has copper wires within it. You send electricity around the copper wires, creates a magnetic field, and then when that magnetic field fluctuates, it stimulates your brain. So you can see that area in red here uh, is not showing up here, but basically the... It's very difficult when you have... That area in red is, is the area that's electrically stimulated by holding this coil over the brain. It's very difficult. And then I've got a little one minute video pressure. here about You have TMS. to will yourself to do just about everything. I was introduced to TMS at the University of Iowa. TMS is magnetic stimulation. So this is a non-invasive way to stimulate the brain electrically. And you can use that to excite the cortex. The reason that we stimulate the left frontal cortex in depression is it's an area that tends to be less active in the setting of major depression. We're still understanding how TMS works. How can we expand the number of patients that we're treating with depression, but also how can we apply it to other disorders of the brain, things like autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. They're all brain-based disorders, so I think TMS should be able to apply to them. In combination with medication and also cognitive therapy, TMS, it's really given me my life back. So I'll apologize to any of you that watch a lot of Iowa sports because you've probably seen that like a hundred times. They play pretty much like uh, every commercial for the Big Ten Network. But it's been really helpful in helping us get the word out about TMS. Uh, we still pretty regularly will get new referrals for people that have learned of TMS through that commercial. So that's been really nice. And then just running through the different missions that we have, the first is clinical, and primarily we're treating adult patients with depression. I would say that is 95% of what we're doing clinically with TMS currently. Uh, to date, so you just met one of our patients in that commercial, we've treated 395 to date, uh, which equates to over 14,000 TMS treatments uh, administered. So we've been quite busy, we have about 10 to 15 patients every day now. And one of the highlights, I think, of the clinical enterprise for TMS at Iowa is we've really helped to expand insurance coverage throughout the state of Iowa. When I moved here in 2016, there was no insurance coverage for TMS across Medicare or Medicaid or commercial providers. And it was really related to, I think, a lack of advocacy and a lack of providers here that were offering TMS. So we were able to um, advocate across different insurance companies. And now we have 100% coverage across Medicaid, Medicare, all commercial providers. So that's been really positive. In terms of research, uh, we've also been busy, so we've com completed two clinical trials. Uh, we have 15 peer-reviewed articles, a few more in preparation, a patent. Uh, we have $4.4 million awarded in research grants, and then I, I sent these slides yesterday, but with this $3.9 million grant as pending, but we actually just got notice of award late yesterday afternoon, so add another $3.9 million to that, so research has been going well. Uh, one of the main initiatives that we've been pioneering is this new combination of techniques. So there's still a lot of questions about how TMS stimulates the brain, how it propagates to different brain areas. Um, and when we understand that, we'll be able to better utilize it to treat depression, we'll be better equipped to transition to different indications for neurological and psychiatric disorders. 
So we're still looking for a really basic uh, explanation of what TMS is doing to the brain. And we have relatively limited methods available to ask those questions. So things like functional MRI, EEG, which is electrodes on the surface of the head. And they don't really provide the level of resolution that we need to explain it. So we're the first group in the world that has pioneered this approach where we're working with our neurosurgery colleagues. I heard Matt Howard just presented here today. So we're collaborating with Matt and his group, and we're doing TMS in neurosurgical patients that have electrodes implanted inside their brain for clinical reasons. So they're epilepsy patients. They need to spend about two weeks in the hospital with electrodes in their brain to find out where their seizures are starting. And we're utilizing that situation, delivering TMS, and then recording it in real time. And, and that's been a boon to understand how TMS works. And that's the sort of impetus for this new grant that we're collaborating with Stanford University and Harvard University, where we're going to try to expand that approach and uh, help them develop it at their programs as well. We also have a new clinical trial that's going to be starting late this summer or early fall that Nick Trapp is the principal investigator on. So this is the SAINT protocol with TMS, which is kind of the new exciting thing in the TMS field. Um, it's been featured in NPR recently in New York Times, and it's it's basically a very intensive method of delivering TMS. So usually it's delivered one session per day, every day for four to six weeks. And this takes all that TMS and condenses it down into a single day. Uh, so a 10 hour day where you're getting TMS once an hour and then you do that the next day and the next day and the next day. So five days of really intensive TMS and they've been getting fantastic results. Uh, so this will be the first multi-site clinical trial. We're one of four sites that'll be involved in that and uh, utilizing it for patients who come to the emergency room who are admitted to the hospital for severe depression and suicidality. So it's another exciting area for research. And finally, uh, where one of our core missions is education, uh, trying to train the next generation of scientists and medical doctors who are going to be continuing to develop upon these technologies and learning how to deliver them as well as we can. And for that, one of our highlights is we partnered with the Sydney Bear Junior Foundation, which is a St. Louis-based organization, uh, to fund a fellowship in non-invasive brain stimulation. So we just offered that uh, to our first incoming fellows this last year. Um, so that's either physicians who have finished their training or scientists who have finished their training who are interested in subspecialization in non-invasive brain stimulation. We've uh, awarded 44 TMS training certificates at our site, it kind of ran ranges from undergraduates who are interested in learning about this for research purposes, all the way to um, medical residents who are interested in developing this so they can use it in their clinical practice. And one of the nice uh, benefits of training residents in the state of Iowa is our psychiatry residents can go on and start their own TMS programs, and that happened most recently with Dr. Jorgensen starting a program in Mason City. Uh, which is in some of our necks of the woods, it sounds like. So it's exciting for me as well to have even a small hand in, in expanding the reach of TMS to other islands. And that's just a real quick glimpse of what we're doing. We have a website up if you guys want to check out more of that. Um, it's a good resource for that. And I'm presenting on behalf of a large team. So we have, first of all, Peg Napolis, who's the chair of psychiatry, and Ted Abel, who's the director of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute. Uh, they've really helped us spearhead this center and develop it. And we have my lab on the top there and our interventional psychiatry team on the bottom there. So we have a fantastic group. And I want to thank all of you for your attention. Very happy to take any questions if you have any. Yeah. Yep. Yep, good question. How long does it last? So when we started this, uh, it was 37 and a half minutes. That was the originally FDA approved protocol. And then just in 2018, there was a large multi-site clinical trial that developed a new, more efficient protocol that's only three minutes. And it was compared across 400 patients and the newer, more efficient protocol worked equally as well as the 37 and a half minute one. So we've, we've opted to go with the three minute one as most centers have. So after you've done the session, how long does it last? Yep, good question. So it, it usually starts to take an effect within the first, say two to four weeks of getting treatment. So it's not immediate, uh, but then it usually is durable on the order of several months. So it's hard to quote an exact number, but uh, nine months to 15 months is a common range for how long it lasts. 
And for those people who respond really well to TMS, you know, if they were to have a relapse a year later or 15 months later, they're often interested in having another course. Regent Barker. So you know that it works, but you don't exactly know how it works or why it works. Yeah, I think that's accurate. I mean, there, there are things that we can say that we know happen, but there are a lot of details that we don't know. And, but you know there, there are no sort of side effects or harm? Very limited. So it's painful, it's annoying to get your head tapped by TMS. I've had it done multiple times, uh, just trying things out. And it feels like a woodpecker tapping on the forehead, basically. <laughs> Uh, so, so it can be a little painful. There's a very, very low risk of inducing a seizure on the order of like one in 100,000. Um, but beyond that, it tends to be very well tolerated. There are no cognitive side effects that we've, uh, we've observed. Um, we actually see, we always measure cognition with a MOCA screening test before and after the course of TMS, and there's actually a slight improvement, which might be secondary to improved mood. Um, but I think that's one of the great advantages relative to things like ECT. What about uh, your work with autism? Have you had much of a chance to use it? That? Yeah, that's a good question. We have a small clinical trial. I didn't include that as one of the finished clinical trials because it's been, we've been slow to recruit patients. Um, and we don't have any dedicated funding for autism, but we do have an IRB approved to, to use it as a therapy for autism, for adults with autism. It's a major interest, but not a very active <coughs> project right now. I think it's hopeful in the sense that um, we know that autism is a brain disorder and there are regional circuits within the brain that are contributing to symptoms. Um, and we can modulate those circuits with TMS. So I think there's, I think the nuts and bolts are there for TMS to be an effective therapy, but I think there are a lot of things that have to happen before we can start to be optimistic about it. Like I don't wanna give any false impressions that we're getting close to a treatment for autism or anything like that, because I think we're a long ways off, but I am optimistic that TMS could offer some help in the same way that it offers help for people who have depression. I have a question. Uh, Regent Bates. So if somebody wants this treatment and they live in one of the other 99 counties, do they need a referral from their provider? And is, is there a parameter that they have to meet before they would or anybody before yep, they can yep. have that. Great question. So yes, generally people are referred by their provider, whether it's their primary care provider or psychiatrist. Some people self-refer as well. They'll see that commercial and they'll be like, hey, I think I would benefit from that and they'll email us, uh, which is totally fine as well. We'll do an evaluation um, and then we'll go through the prior authorization process to see if they qualify from their insurance standpoint and then we can offer treatment here. And that really works best for people who are within about a 90 minute minute uh, range of Iowa City. It's really difficult to do this on a daily basis if you're, you know, in northwest Iowa. So that's why we're excited about the growing, uh, growing programs throughout different parts of the state. Thank you very much. We yeah, appreciate it. you're welcome. It. Thank you. Appreciate your work. At this time, I'd uh, recognize Brad Bird and his uh, team. Thank you, President Richards and members of the board. Uh, before the board today is the final reading of the proposed tuition and mandatory fees, as well as the common and university specific fees for the 23-24 academic year. The proposed based undergraduate resident tuition rates include a three and a half percent increase at each of the three universities. And the docket also includes varying rate proposals to other student categories 
such as non-residents, graduates, and professional students, as well as differential rates for higher cost programs. Uh, the board is also asked to approve the allocation of the student activities and student services fee and the building fees as recommended by the student fee committees. Uh, I want to thank the student government leaders for joining us here today and they are present to comment on uh, the tuition proposals. So unless there's questions for me at this time, uh, we can hear from the students. Our first presenter from Iowa State's undergraduate student government is Jennifer Holliday. Jennifer. Hello, my name is Jennifer Holliday. I'm currently serving as the Vice President of the Student Body at Iowa State University. On behalf of our student body, I would like to first extend thanks to the board for allowing me to speak today on the proposed tuition and fee rates for the upcoming academic year. The discussion regarding tuition and fees is never simple and often must be considered from the viewpoint of various stakeholders. When taking into consideration enrollment changes, expansion of campus resources and operational expenses, our system has a complex fiscal issue that needs to be addressed to ensure that students at Iowa's public universities receive the valuable education and opportunities that attracted them there initially. However, we need to find solutions to this issue without increasing the financial burden attending a higher education institution already bears on our students. We understand the decision to increase tuition is not one taken lightly or made out of apathy, but rather out of necessity. The deficit between state allocations and necessary costs must be supplemented for the sake of student success. Every dollar utilized by Iowa State University is an investment into the research and success of our students throughout our outstanding curriculum, research, technology, and campus services. However, deeper consideration needs to be taken on the fact that as much as these tuition and fee increases benefit our students' successes, it also inhibits them. When students must make the choice between eating or purchasing textbooks, or decide between going to work and attending class to be able to afford school, we have an issue. Tuition has continuously increased at our university since the turn of the century, yet funding support from the state has been stagnated. The acquisition of additional funds from the state is laborious, even with the support of the board, yet it shouldn't be. It needs to be recognized that none of us would be living the lives we are today if it weren't for individuals working towards degrees or conducting research that allows them to become engineers, agronomists and animal scientists, doctors, politicians, and even educators who will go on to teach the next generation of innovators. However, we will not have individuals to fulfill these essential careers if they cannot afford to, take, to get the education that it requires to achieve these careers. As we prepare for the next meeting of the State General Assembly, Iowa State Student Government is ready to advocate alongside the board and our other Regent Universities to secure increased allocations from the state. Increased tuition and fees may be the short-term fix, but it is not a viable long-term solution for our students attending Iowa State University. As much as I would like to continue, I will end by saying thank you to you all for allowing me to speak today in representation of the more than 30,000 students who are impacted by these important decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, from the UI undergraduate student government, we have Carly O'Brien. Carly. Good afternoon. Thank you to the board for giving student leaders this opportunity to share our thoughts on the budget increases. I am honored to represent over 21,000 undergraduate students at the University of Iowa, each of whom are impacted by our conversation today. While we acknowledge the need for these increases, we want to highlight some of the daily financial challenges and struggles that students face. Students are being worn too thin. One of the many monetary costs for students is housing. Most undergraduate students live off campus after their freshman year at Iowa and face an average monthly rent of $652 in Iowa City. With the high cost of rent, coupled with 30% of students reporting using over half of their income, likely from lower paying jobs on housing, puts students under a heavy financial and emotional burden. Another monetary cost is acquiring an adequate amount of food. 
67% of students at Iowa report eating less because they could not afford food. As a STEM major, I regularly learn about the importance of nutrition for daily functioning and have seen students struggle with the ultimatum to buy textbooks or food. Personally, I am one of the many out-of-state students who are no stranger to the struggle to pay higher tuition rates. Last academic year, I found myself working three small part-time jobs to offset the costs of my education and living. Additionally, for our president, Mitch Winterland, who cannot be here today, he is a native Iowan and first-generation student and has seen from personal perspectives the difficulty for our students to afford tuition. There are 1,000 new first-generation students who come to Iowa every year, many from blue-collar families like Mitch's, where college is just not an embedded cost in their plans. However, I would be remiss if I did not recognize the letter of support that Iowa undergraduate student governments wrote regarding fee increases to renovate our Iowa Memorial Union last October. In this letter, we supported an increased fee total of $240 per undergraduate student. What justified this increase for our undergraduate student governments was the promise of a well-being center in the hub of our campus, which would increase access to student services. Next, I would like to commend the state by working on the Iowa Workforce Grant and Incentivize Program. As a nursing interest, I am encouraged because a program like this is definitely a step in the right direction for the state of Iowa's future. And I hope that the board and state legislator continue to promote workforce development and scholarship opportunities to continue to impact the greatest amount of students. And I leave you with this. As students, we are foundational to funding the university's operations, and we ask that the investment in our student services meet that of the increased investment we have made into our own education as students. We hope our call for collaboration between the state legislator Board of Regents and Regent Institutions to lower the burden of financial costs of tuition on students is heard and increased with state allocations. The Board of Regents work for our Regent Universities is greatly appreciated. So thank you all. And thank you for your time today and we look forward to collaborating with you all in the future. Go Hawks. Thank you Carly. Uh, next representing UNI's student government is Micaiah Krutzinger. Micaiah. Good afternoon. When I was searching for a college to attend, I wasn't looking for a Big Ten or a Big 12 experience. I wanted to attend a college that was quite smaller and still had plenty of opportunities for me. As a regional comprehensive university, you and I offered me exactly what I was looking for, and I'm able to enjoy a personable education in the classroom. When comparing the tuition rates for regional comprehensive universities and public research universities in other states, you would notice they are thousands of dollars apart from each other, whereas Iowa's is only a few hundred. Since you and I provides a unique opportunity to the state, I encourage the legisl legislature and the Board of Regents to look at how you and I is being funded. In fact, if the core inflation is expected to be around 4% in 2023 and 3% in 2024, why is the state's 2024 appropriations for general funding staying flat while tuition is proposed to increase 3.5%? In fiscal year 2001, 63.7% of the three universities' general funding came from the state and 30.6% from tuition. Now, for fiscal year 2023's budget, it's nearly flipped with 30.5% from the state and 63.8% from tuition. In fact, our three universities combined currently have $57.5 million less in general funding from the state as compared to 2001. That's approximately negative 10.4%. And I can tell you that since that time, the economy has not seen a deflation of 10.4%. Why must the burden of inflation fall strictly on the students and their families who want to attend college? Shouldn't the point of public education be that it's affordable and benefit the public, the entire state? I know students who rely on loan after loan to fund their education because they can't afford current tuition prices. This can cause a financial stressor for these students, and financial stress combined with other college stressors can take a toll on a student's mental health. I know students who have had to drop out of college to focus on their mental health, and even worse, 
trigger warning for those who may need it, have taken their own life. Suicides are the second leading cause of death for Iowans aged 15 to 24 and third for Iowans ages 25 to 44. Northern Iowa student government is willing to work with university, board, and state officials to address the need for more mental health resources on our campuses and additional state allocations to fund our public universities. But we cannot accomplish this without the state's help. I know this decision to raise tuition does not come easily to the board. I believe if you all could, you'd vote to decrease it. However, we know that this decision must be made in order to maintain the quality of education our three regent universities offer. In future years, we do hope to see an increase in support from the state, especially to achieve the gap between the regional comprehensive and research universities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Micaiah. Um, from Iowa State's Graduate and Professional Student Senate is Christine Kane. Christine. Members of the board, thank you for your time and allowing me to use my voice on behalf of the graduate students at Iowa State. The rising cost of college is something that many graduate students across our state have felt not once, but multiple times during their educational journey. On average, college students accrue greater than $37,000 in debt by the time they complete their undergraduate degree, and if they choose to pursue the professional or doctorate level degree, that debt can exceed 100,000, maybe even 200,000 for programs such as veterinary medicine. It is because of student debt, rising tuition, and the cost of being a student that now demands a, type of, a kind of hypervigilance towards payment and funding because we are already seeing the severe consequences of delayed financial independence due to student debt. To use a personal example, my PhD program will last me for maybe five years, but I've been carrying the debt for my master's program since 2016 and will likely continue to carry these and other debts I accrue for decades to come. So here are the consequences of raising our tuition. Rising tuition means that students feel obliged to only choose careers that pay, often ignoring personal interest and talent. What does a career that pays really mean? Well, if it means paying off one's college debt within 10 years after graduation, then our viable career options go down, as is demonstrated by the current shortage of teachers. In order to take on that debt, you have to choose something that pays. Research has demonstrated that rising tuition costs lowers college access, affecting the diversity of our student body as it becomes f less and less affordable for many of our low and income, middle income families. It also affects where we go after getting our degree. Tuition and student debt increases pressure to get a high paying job. And although many of us were born here, have settled here, and would like to remain here in Iowa, that threat of personal debt and financial hardship is not a choice many people want to make after putting in so much work to better themselves through a degree. Each and every citizen in Iowa interacts, relies on, or benefits from college educated people, and our current and future society depends on inspiring students to pursue a variety of careers and ideas despite the cost. But this shift in placing the burden in higher education on individuals and families, it starts with the Appropriations Committee in the Iowa Legislature. However, the Board of Regents and our higher education institutions perpetuate this problem by addressing funding shortages with ever-rising tuition. At this point in time, the graduate students at Iowa State recognize that rising tuition may be the only short-term solution for keeping important university functions and the quality of higher education at Iowa State. However, it feels ironic to be using student tuition dollars to address items like recruitment and retention of faculty and staff when legislatures in this state have themselves created these deficits through attacks on tenure, critical race research, and DEI efforts. It is our request and recommendation that this board and the regent institutions come together to look more seriously at the impact and accountability of Iowa legislature on higher education issues, address the effects of rising tuition costs for all Iowans, and explore alternative options for revenue in the future. We look forward to be working with you with this very large request. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, lastly, from the University of Iowa's graduate and professional student government, Mason Colm. Mason? Thank you for allowing me to speak. No one here wants to raise tuition, but we understand we must, at least in the short term. These increases, combined with increased allocations from the state, will expand much needed mental health services and improvements to university facilities. However, it is also important to keep in mind the needs of the students who will be impacted. As student government leaders, turnover means that we don't necessarily have 
as good of a long-term perspective as the regions. In my lifetime, tuition at the University of Iowa has skyrocketed across programs, around 600% on average with graduate and professional programs like dentistry, nursing, and medicine facing the highest increases. And these trends are apparent in the short term as well. In 2017, the year I first attended the university, the most expensive program, dentistry, was slightly over twice the cost of undergraduate tuition and fees. Next year, under the proposed tuition and fees, it will be nearly five times as much. While the current proposals for tuition increases exempt several graduate and professional programs, this does not undo historic increases that disproportionately impact postgraduate students. And as we know, tuition and fees are not the only expenses of students. Last month, the average rent in the country was the highest in recorded history. In 25 years, the fair market rent of Iowa City more than doubled, while general inflation increased by 70%. How do students pay for those increases? I am pleased to say that graduate student salaries have increased, though have not kept price with inflation and have certainly not kept pace with tuition inflation. In addition, median entry wages for all occupations in Iowa dropped substantially between 2017 and 2023, though occupations requiring advanced degrees increased around 18%. In that same period, inflation was around 22%. Now, during the pandemic, there were several factors that helped ease the burden of college students. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program expanded its coverage of college students, but that coverage expired on Sunday. The CARES Act Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund grant money has also been exhausted. At the institutional level, the University of Iowa continues to support the food pantry and clothing closet to provide no-cost opportunities to supplement student needs. During the summer, however, those services are only offered 10 and four hours a week, respectively. In addition, student government provides grants for research, service, and travel for our students. But these institutional resources are not meeting the needs of our students, and federal solutions are ending. More needs to be done at the state level, as we're reporting a, a fiscal budget, the largest in our state's history. Inflation is hurting students across the board as we pay our rent, as we buy our textbooks, as we buy our groceries, and as we pay tuition. We are worse off than we were at the start of the millennium, and we are worse off than when I started college. But with the proposed tuition and fees, we are on track to improve. The graduate and professional students of the University of Iowa support the proposed plan as a temporary solution, and we support the continued efforts of the regents to improve the lives of students and graduates across the state. Thank you for your time and advocacy. Thank you, Mason. Mr. President, that concludes the comments from our student leaders. And with that, we'd be happy to respond to any questions or, or comments you may have. Does anyone have any questions for Abby? Mm -hmm. uh, Regent Grove. Just to make a comment, I appreciate you all being very honest with us today and speaking on behalf of your constituencies. And thank you as well for um, your commentary during the breakfast we had earlier today. And look forward to our relationship going ahead this next year. Any other comments or questions? Well, we, we do appreciate your, your thoughts. They're very articulate and uh, we thank you for your time. Thank you. A motion and second are required to approve the following. The proposed tuition and mandatory fees for 2023-24 2024 academic year as outlined in the agenda item effective with the fall 2023 session. B, the allocation of the Regent University's mandatory student fees for the 2023 academic year as outlined in the agenda item. C, the proposed common and university program specific fees for the 2023-24 academic year 
is outlined in the agenda item. Is there a motion? So moved. Regent Parker moves. I'll second. And Regent Bates seconds. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Kramer? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Ryswick? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes, the motion is approved. Now, in our continuing rejuggling of our agenda, uh, we're all, we are going to hear from Superintendent Cool first. I don't know if you knew that. And the other presidents uh, have agreed to waive their time to speak uh, after Superintendent Cool. It's much different than just walking the plank, I got to tell you. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to address you one more time here at the Regent meeting. I've been uh, coming to Regent meetings since 1990, but as you listen to me today, I'd just like to ask you to think about the 200 employees for the School for the Deaf and the School for the Blind and the 150 part-timers that we have. Some of those part-timers part I like to call our weekend warriors because they come in and they transport our kids home every Friday and bring them back every Sunday. Uh, and it takes quite a fleet to get that accomplished. And so as I speak to you today, I'm here for all of them as well. It's not just for me. It's mostly for them and for our students, the families, and all of their friends and all of the deaf community and the blind community who continue to support us so strongly. I'm going to have to put my glasses on because I am getting older. And I just want to say that I'm a, I'm a licensed mental health therapist. And so there's this thing called forming, storming, norming, and performing that we do. And uh, lately, we've been doing a lot of forming and storming. And uh, we're trying to norm. We're trying to get in line with what DAS and DOM want to have us do as we transition to the Department of Education. And you know, after every storm, then things really start to clear up. And sometimes we're just much better off than we were before. I can't imagine that that will be true, and I state that publicly, I know, but um, I used to work for the Department of Education. I spent 10 years there. I know there's lots of possibilities. I look forward to those possibilities. I've already had conversations with folks from the Department of Education that I know are going to uh, have a positive impact on the two schools. And so I look forward to continuing to work with them and strengthening our collaboration. But I just want to share with you a couple of things that have occurred over the years that I've been there, and I promise to keep this under two hours. Isn't that how much? But anyway, um, since 1953, when the special schools went underneath the governance of the Board of Regents, um, I can honestly say that the relationship that we've had with you folks over those years has been amazing. It's been absolutely amazing. I can't tell you how many regents and board office staff I've worked with over the years who have provided us with such amazing support. We couldn't accomplish the things that we do today if it wasn't for the support that we receive, the advocacy that we receive, the things that you do behind the scenes, and I'll mention just a couple of those. Back in the 1980s, there was a big shift in deaf education, and you don't really know that shift if you're not involved in deaf education, but it was more the schools for the deaf had a lot of faculty and staff who worked there who didn't sign. There wasn't manual communication, and in the classrooms you weren't allowed to use manual communication. They would learn that in the dormitories. And it wasn't used for academics. And in, in late 1980s, the Board of Regents supported a new policy for Iowa School for the Deaf where we implemented the sign language 
policy so that staff were required to learn sign language whether they worked in the grounds or in the powerhouse or they were a faculty or worked in the dorms. The kitchen staff, custodial staff, they all started learning sign language so that everywhere you go on campus, every staff person can communicate with students and other staff who are deaf uh, to some degree. And depending on their jobs, that's different. But the Board of Regents passed that policy for us, helped us to implement that change, and it was very much appreciated. I just want to say in 1996, you folks won't know this, but the trail that goes through ISD's campus connects the Wabash Trail heading south to Missouri and going north to Harlan, Iowa, a bicycle trail. And it was the Board of Regents who helped us to pass that so that we could put that trail in through ISD to connect those two north and south. It had to go through our property because across the street was Lewis Central's parking lot and it wasn't going to go through a parking lot. So we appreciated that uh, we were able to get that passed. In 97, 98, we worked with the Board of Regents when Nebraska School for the Deaf decided to close their school. We feel very fortunate that we still have a school here in Iowa. There are many schools for the deaf across the country who have closed because of numbers. And we've had such great support from the regents that we've been able to maintain that. Now we have 14 students and probably two or three more in the fall from Nebraska, which is a huge increase considering in 2021 we were down because of COVID to two students from Nebraska. This fall we anticipate having 16. Our numbers dropped to 68 for Iowa. And we anticipate that we'll be around 110 in the fall of this year. So the numbers are going in the right direction for us. In 2001, see I jumped forward pretty quickly. In 2001 and in the end of 2002, we built the last building that was built on the campus. It had been a long time since a building had been built, like 1971 or 72. And we built the lead multi-purpose complex, which is where we host all of the regent meetings. And that was accomplished in 2002. And that was from the support of the regents. We received additional $4.75 million uh, from the state and capital funds in order to accomplish that building. And we wouldn't have been able to do that without the regents. You supported the change. It was quite a shift on the blind side when we went from a campus-based program to statewide services, when we went from what was about 35 students being served on the campus to taking that same budget and providing services to 650 plus blind and visually impaired students around the state. In 2020, um, let me just back up for a minute. In 2018, we moved all of the services for blind and visually impaired from the Vinton campus to the Council Bluffs campus. And we were able to accomplish that through a lot of work from the board office staff, through the support of the regents, and now ISD, the campus in Council Bluffs, actually is home to both IESBVI and ISD, as you well know. And we, we are really uh, enjoying quite a positive relationship with those folks who are now, I'm one of those folks. Um, also in 2020, you helped us navigate. The board office gave us tremendous support when it came to COVID-19 and getting through the pandemic, continuing education for our K-12 kids through that whole time. And then in 2022 with the Lead K legislation, um, I just want to tell you, I want to share this story with you really quickly because it's it really tantamount to what you folks have provided for us. So there was a grassroots movement among the deaf community to get Lead K legislation passed, and it's language equality and acquisition for deaf students who are entering kindergarten, who are on, you want to have them on the same level as the hearing peers who enter kindergarten, and many of those students come in with five or ten words. And if you know a five-year-old, a five-year-old can really talk to you. And when you're deaf and you're language deprived and you get to school and you have that limited language, uh, that's why we need to get to those families early, from birth to three, birth to eight. We need to get to them and get them language. We were able to accomplish that, but that, after several years of doing that, the deaf folks fell short of getting that passed in the legislature. And Mary Brown and the board office staff, a couple of regents, uh, Regent Butger and Regent Bates, uh, started attending meetings. Rachel Boone started attending meetings. And I don't want to be a name dropper because everybody, I mean, I'm being a name dropper, but everybody has support, has supported us here. And those were the representatives who came to the meetings. And it was at that time that we really got traction. 
And the traction was good until it hit a wall and it died. And then uh, there was a conversation between Danny Carroll and Mary Brown that resurrected that. And the next thing we knew, the governor was signing that into law. And so we got lead K legislation. And it never would have happened if it would have stayed at the grassroots level for the deaf community as hard as they worked. Because you know that it takes, it takes people who know people to get things accomplished. And so we really appreciate that. And now we have funding that's going to allow us to put together that family mentoring program. And we're grateful for that, too. So we get that $200,000 July 1. And we're going to be able to hire a family mentoring program coordinator and get that program really moving forward. And we're excited about that. Um, and then twice now in the, in the recent past, we received big time funding, capital funding, to uh, renovate Long Hall, our high school, middle school building. And you folks got a chance to look at that. And now we've received additional monies, $5.7 million July 1 over the next two years. We're going to receive that funding to renovate our girls' dormitory health center area. And uh, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I won't probably see the completion of that but um, I'll at least get to see the start of it next year. I'm excited about that, and I, we thank you for that. Um, I just want to talk briefly about the transition um, to the Department of Education. All of the work that the staff and the board office are doing, that Deb LaHoop, our HR person, that Mark Hoos, our Director of Business Operations, that all the people are doing on the campus, I can't take credit for all the work that they're doing because they're doing an impeccable job of working with Department of Administrative Services, Department of Management, iGov, uh, and with the Department of Education to help us through this transition. I can't say enough to thank them for all the work they're doing because I, I know that this isn't the only job they have is to get us transitioned. And, uh, but it feels like this is the only job they have because they're right there every time we email them, they're right there with a response. If we need a phone call, they're there to take the phone call. If we need to text them, they're there for that. And uh, you guys have a, an incredible staff, as you know, that works there in the board office. And uh, I'm going to miss working with them. May Amy, per Amy particular has bailed me out of some really tough spots when it comes to parents. And I'll save you all the language that came across in those emails and texts and everything that we received. But be assured it was flowery. <laughs> and so while on a whole, our faculty and our staff haven't had the opportunity to get to know any of you on a personal level, um, I know that they would be privileged and, and it, it would be a pleasure for them to get to know you and, and vice versa. I know you would enjoy meeting them as well. But that doesn't the way that it works. It's me, it's Mark Hoos, it's my administrative assistant, Megan Jeffaloni, who get the opportunity to interact and get to know you folks. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, but I, I do want to thank you on behalf of all those people Without all the support and the work of the board office staff, this wouldn't be possible. On behalf of all the students, families, employees, as well as our deaf and blind communities, we want to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation for all that you've done to support the education of the students we serve. We wish all of you and the universities continued success. Our state is strong because our universities are strong. There's no question about it. And I'm really going to miss the opportunity to sit and listen each and every time I come to a board meeting, the updates from the universities. We're fortunate to have your leadership, and we're fortunate to have your support. You could be leaders without really being that supportive, right? But you guys are all supportive of, and you listen, and you're here, and you dedicate your time. Uh, really appreciate that, and I thank you so much again for the opportunity to work with you. Um, I, this won't be the last you probably hear about me in the schools because we've got a year here that we're going to be transitioning. And our experience with all of these places is, well, we're going to do this, this, and this with, you know, college aid, with STEM, and so And then there's the special schools. We're really different. And so I don't know how we're going to fit into all of it, but we're certainly going to be working really hard on, on getting that done um, over the course of the next year. And so our final transition to the department is a little different than everyone else's. We will go on their benefits July 1, so we'll be transitioning, um, but we really won't finish that transition until July 1 of 24 is what they're anticipating. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I just really, I'm just really grateful. Thank you very much. 
Are there any other comments? Sherry? I just want to thank you and all the staff every time in all the years that we have come to your campus. We have been treated, you know, with, with respect and such kindness. And they're so proud of their students and what they can accomplish. And uh, just saw a lot of good things there. So uh, thank you. Is there any other business to come before the board? Hearing none, this meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned. <laughs>